Hello, and I'm back. We are up to page 357, uh, chapter 85. So I'm just going to get started. Chapter 85. I opened my eyes, let out a gasp, and sat upright on the couch. Aiden steadied me by grabbing my shoulders and slowly laid me back down. Give yourself a minute, he said. Take a deep breath and hold it. Okay, now let it out. I exhaled forcefully and looked over at him. How do you feel? I leaned up on my elbow. How do I feel? I feel like I just got shot out of a cannon. Then I, t I shook my head and let out some noise that sounded something like, FLA! Stay here. Aiden got up and brought me my notebook and a pen. I want you to write down everything you remember. Everything you saw, everything you heard, every possible detail. I sat up. I've got to get to my Bible study. What time is it anyway? He cocked his head to the side and gave me a look. Sorry. Yes, sir. Are you staying here? Don't worry about the Bible study, he said. I'll hang out for a while in case you have any questions. My eyes bugged out. Questions? God, Aiden, where do I start? Was I really there? Well, what was that Vivian woman's deal? How did Pastor Faust get back from the church to get back to the church from that field? And why is it that the whole We'll go over all that later, he said. Right now, I just want you to record everything you can remember. Could you see me there? I tried to get your attention a couple of times, but you acted like... Aiden shoved the pen in my face. You're a writer. Now write. Yes, sir. It took me about an hour to get it all, all down on paper to my satisfaction. Good thing my little trip into the Twilight Zone took no time, but it was still awfully late when I finished. I couldn't believe all the little details I remembered. Pastor Faust's sermon, the things people said, the expressions on their faces. A few times I remembered something later on after I'd finished writing the section, so I had to go back and add it in the margin. Aiden read it over when I finished. He made little grunting noises every once in a while as he read, but he never did give me an, an opinion one way or the other on it. Now what? I wanted to know as I laid the notebook down on the couch. Can I ask my questions now, or do, we, do I have to write those down too? Aiden glanced at the clock on the kitchen wall. You do realize you have to go to bed soon, don't you? You've got the Ladies Auxiliary Weekly Prayer Breakfast at the Paragon tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock. Sharp. He snapped me back to reality, and I had to stop and think. I'll make it, I said. But I do have some things I'm not clear on. But that's to be expected if you see just a small sliver of the past the way you did, he said. Where are all those people now? What people? Like that Clarence guy that Pastor Faust helped out, I said. The man with the lump on his neck or whatever. I never heard anything about him, and he's not in the church as far as I know. You have to keep in mind that you haven't been here that long. You haven't had time to hear about every single person who's ever been in the ministry. And you don't typically spend time or talk with people who were in the church back then. Yeah, I felt very inadequate all of a sudden, but I tried to ignore it. Clarence passed away in the late 70s. There are probably some pictures of him around the church somewhere. You just haven't seen them. Okay, then. What was Pastor Faust's problem with Vivian? Are you going to write any of this down? He asked me. Oh, sorry. I picked up my notebook again. My hand's cramping up pretty bad. You'll live. Vivian? Yeah, said Vivian, the boarding house lady. Pastor Faust didn't seem to like her too much, and she didn't have any use for him either. What happened between those two? Pastor Faust gets along with people pretty well for the most part unless they do something to him first, or that's the impression I get. Why don't you go ask Vivian yourself? Really? She's still alive? She must be a thousand years old by now. About that, Aiden said. She still lives at the boarding house, only it's not a boarding house anymore. She lives there by herself. She smokes, though, so when you go, take off your clothes as soon as you get home and put them in a plastic bag until you can make it to the laundromat again. He gave me a peculiar smile. It'd be bad for your testimony to go around smelling like cigarette smoke. Good idea, I said. I'll do that. When can I go see her? Whenever you can get away. I mean, when you have some free time. That is so cool, I said. Can I go now? It's too late to go today. Maybe you can go tomorrow after the prayer breakfast. Any more questions? Right. My mind had gone blank. Oh, yeah. Why didn't you say anything when I tried to get your attention? Didn't you know I was there? I didn't know you were there. You were in the past, and as far as the past is concerned, you didn't exist. The me you saw was the 1970 me, not the me sitting here today. So this isn't part of some big plan you've known about all along. Some things I don't know, he said. The circumstances that led up to you writing this biography, 
going back to see the tornado for yourself, that's all recent stuff. You saw everything just as it happened, but you weren't really there. How do you think you could stand up there with Charles while he was preaching without anybody asking who you were or what you were doing up there? Didn't you wonder why nobody spoke to you or even looked at you? You were just an unseen, unseen observer collecting facts, which is the best way to do it if you ask me. Have you ever done this with other people? I asked. I only pull that trick out of my hat on special occasions. Well, what's the occasion here? I asked him. Honestly? Honestly. Things aren't going too well with this biography, he said. Now don't get me wrong, you're doing the best you can, but we need to hurry this thing up. He stood up inside. The problem is, I can't push it too fast. That's the that's a real challenge when I know how little time we have left. What do you mean? I can't answer that, Liddy. I don't see why. Is that all you wanted to ask me? I thought about it for a minute. I guess so, for now. Okay, go get ready for bed then. After he left to go back to the church, I wrote down my questions and Aiden's answers. All my pages of notes went into the safe before I took my shower and lay back down on the couch for a horrible night's sleep. Chapter 86 Word had filtered down to the single brothers at the Baton Rouge church about Pastor Faust's troubles, and it upset them a great deal. Carl addressed it in an emergency meeting with, with them as soon as he heard they'd been told. It was early Saturday morning, the day after Liddy interviewed Sister Faust. Carl stood on the stage in the sanctuary as usual, with all the single brothers sitting quietly in the front two pews. I want to know how I want to know who found out first, he said, and then I want to know how the rest of you found out. A brother slowly raised his hand. Yes, what? Carl said. I heard it from Brother Brian Beauchamp in the Dalton Fisher Church, the brother said. Brother Brian Beauchamp? A no good waste. To go around spreading tales about our bishop is just out of line, even for the likes of him. God, he's pathetic. So how did everybody else find out? The brother trembled. I sort of, well, it shocked me to hear about it, so I asked some of the other brothers, single brothers, if they knew about it. I guess it just sort of went from there. You should have come to me, Carl said. What have I always told you? If you hear something bad about the ministry and you want to know the truth, don't go to each other. Come to me. God, how hard is it for you to remember? You'll never get the truth by milling around amongst yourselves and trying to figure anything out. If you don't believe me, look at our bro the former brother Noel if you want a good example of what happens when you try to do that. He shook his finger at the brothers. Now, like always, y'all understand that everything that's said in this room stays in this room, correct? Yes, sir, the brothers answered. Okay, good. I'd hate for anybody to suffer former brother Noel's fate for disobeying. He's no longer with us because he couldn't keep his mouth shut. I don't want you discussing it any more with anybody, even each other, after this meeting. Don't take any notes about it either. I don't want to run the risk of you leaving those notes anywhere for anybody else to pick up and read. This time, the, the rumors you've heard are true. Well, partly true. Pastor Faust has been accused of some things. He's in trouble right now, just as I knew he would be, as God himself showed me not too long ago. He has a group of protesters, mostly from a Methodist church up there, who say he's been sexually abusing the single men and young boys in the church, like including Brother Eduardo. Speaking of Brother Eduardo, he's now staying with Pastor Faust and Sis full-time. Well, he was for a few days after Brother Ray Anderson of our Los Angeles congregation sent him there about a week ago. Last Saturday, Child welf Welfare came and got him and put him in foster care. Apparently, something led Brother Eduardo to call the police and tell him he was being abused by Pastor Faust and some of the other single brothers up there in Dalton Fisher, and I guess for his own safety, based on those allegations, they took him out of Pastor Faust's home. I'm sure we all know who was responsible for putting those thoughts in Brother Eduardo's head, making him call the police and tell all those lies. Satan, the brothers said in unison. That's exactly right. We all know nothing like that is going on in our ministry, amen? Amen, they said. <clears throat> the problem is the situation won't be resolved overnight. I'll be called to go to pastor, to pastor that church before it's over with. Thanks be to the Lord, Pastor Faust has already found a couple good attorneys to, res to represent him in the trials and stuff that he'll have to face in the next few weeks and months over this matter with Brother Eduardo. It's going to get nasty, yes, but truth will prevail over evil and deceit in the end. We must not stand for this persecution. We have to fight it and do whatever we can to help out Pastor Faust, and if that means moving up to Dalton Fisher and basically running the whole show, then that's what we'll do. 
the brothers murmured amongst themselves. What's the problem, Carl asked. Some of the brothers voiced their concerns about their jobs, their obligations in Baton Rouge. Oh, that. Well, I have a surprise for you. The church is taking over your debts. All your money worries will be gone. As I've said before, these debts shouldn't even exist, but they do, so we're going to deal with them using the church's resources. You just better remember we did that. You all understand when you took the oath of eunuchship that you were God's minute men. You'd be ready at a minute's notice to go wherever he sent you, do whatever I said needed to be done. I'm here today to tell you two things. One, don't spread this information around to anybody unless you want to be sent on your merry way, just like our former brother Noel. Two, have your bags packed and keep your pagers turned on 24 hours a day. When the time comes and we have to roll on out of here and head to Dalton Fisher, I don't want any of y'all holding things up. If you're at work when you get the call, you better be ready to walk out and never go back. I can't tell you how long we'll be there or what the end result will be, but I promise you God will take care of us. All of us, especially our beloved bishop and founding pastor, C.T. Faust. The men, the men fidgeted nervously as they listened, wishing they could take notes like they always did in these meetings. Having nothing to do with their hands and being expect to, expected to maintain constant eye contact with Carl made them uneasy. How many people in here are scared, he asked the men. Several of them looked around and raised their hands halfway. They weren't sure what the right answer was. God bless you. I'm scared, too, if you want to know the truth about it. The man who... He paused and wiped his eyes. The very man who raised me up in the Lord and taught me how to be a true Christian has come under attack by Satan, and there's nothing I can do now except sit back and watch. I wish there was something I could do to help help him with. I wish there was something I could help him with, but honestly, what can I do for him now other than take over when the time comes? I'll be praying for him, but in this time of persecution, we have to let Satan try to do his thing so in the end, everybody will be able to see it for the trick and scam the whole thing really was. But yes, brothers, I'm scared. I don't know what the outcome will be. I'm optimistic. Oh, I know we'll win out in the end, but who knows what'll happen to us in the meantime? What will happen to our beloved Pastor Faust? Carl sighed and hung his head. I think I may... No, I can't sit idly by during Pastor Faust's time of need. All the times he's been there for us, I have to go see if I can help him. I have to go to Dalton Fisher. Yes, some of the brothers whispered. Yes, Lord, thank you, Jesus. I'll... What should I do, brothers? Should I go? Yes, the brothers answered. Think y'all can do without me for a few days? What about the services tomorrow? Brother Phil? Phil stood up. Yes, sir. Can you lead the services tomorrow? I, I'll do my best, sir. Thank you. Good. That makes me feel a lot better. And hopefully when I come back, I'll have some good news to report. That's all. He disappeared backstage, leaving the brothers alone in their confusion and fear. Chapter 87 I think I overdid it at the prayer breakfast the next morning, feeling like such a bad sister of the faith for not making it to the Bible study the night before. I talked to everybody and laughed and prayed my heart out. It's not that I never did that. I was just more likely to sit quietly and listen to everybody else instead of diving in and yakking my fool head off. Lots of people were genuinely surprised by it. But just as Aiden said, nobody questioned my absence the night before at all, and none of the sisters came by my apartment to check on me when I didn't show up either. That was standard practice. If you weren't present at one of the required activities in the church, they sent two of your brothers or sisters, depending on your gender, by your house to find out why you weren't there. You better have a good excuse for it, too, Pastor Faust had said one time to a group of us single people during our monthly meeting. Sisters sat on one side of the sanctuary and the brothers sat on the other. Pastor Faust liked it that way to cut down on distractions. I don't know how they were arranged when he met with the married parishioners once a month, but I hear he separated the sexes then, too. We go to a lot of trouble to organize these events and outings for y'all to promote fellowship and ministering opportunities, so don't think you can go off and do your own thing. You have to be a team player. We won't take less than that from any of you, and I don't care, ju I don't care how long you've been in this ministry. I won't have any backsliders in my church, understand? Just remember, I've got my eye on each and every one of you. I felt bad because I wasn't doing as much as all the other single sisters were, at least not as far as the fellowshipping and the team playing went. I couldn't tell anybody about the biography and all the neat stuff I'd seen and learned since I started working on it, and that didn't help my mood any. 
Sister Andrea had copies of her notes from the Bible study, and then she, she gave them to me after we finished eating. It was on women's roles in marriage, she said. Very uplifting. God just blessed us all so much. Amen, I said, and I had this sinking feeling in my chest. When is the next Bible study? Tonight, of course, she said. Like this week would be different from any other. You're so silly sometimes. We were thinking about doing it over at Sister Gabby's house. Think you can make it? I'll be there, I said quickly. Can I bring anything? We can never have too many snacks. Can you come pick up, pick me up on the way? Sister Veronica and Sister Drusilla, too? I sure can. What time do you want me to be there? Why don't you just go home with us after we get finished here? We were going to ask you to drive us home anyway. We can spend the whole day together. Dang it, there went my chance to go see Vivian. That sounds wonderful, I said. Our checks came, and Sister Andrew suddenly realized she'd left her money at home. Good old plastic, I said, and went up to the register with my check and hers, and Drew's, and Sister Veronica's. Drew's wasn't much. She said she still wasn't feeling too good, and all that greasy breakfast food turned her stomach. We said goodbye to all the other sisters and drove away. Thanks for taking care of breakfast for us, Sister Veronica called from the back. You're a cool chick. Not a problem, I said. I used a credit card. Then Sister Andrew and I both said at the same time, It's not like it's real money anyway. And then we all laughed. Yeah, it's not real till that bill comes, I said. Sister Andrew perked up. That reminds me. We decided at the Bible study last night that we all really ought to chip in and give a, an extra love offering to the church next Sunday. Do you get paid again before that? You mean a week from tomorrow? Yeah. I had to stop and think. When was my next payday? Uh, what bills were due before I'd get paid again? How much money were we talking about here? Fifty bucks? A hundred? I was already tithing ten percent of my gross monthly pay, standard for OACC people, which was about two hundred and fifty dollars. I couldn't afford a whole lot for this love offering, not without living on that credit card for a few weeks, and I'd had I had enough charged on it already. The move up there had cost me close to a thousand dollars, and I'd spent all my savings. Ugh, that minimum payment would just have to get a little bit bigger again. I smiled. It was all for the good of the ministry anyway, and Pastor Faust needed our love and support at that point more than ever. Yeah, I said, I think I can manage it. Sister Andrew reached over and squeezed my shoulder. You really encourage me, you know. Gosh, all you've been through, quitting your job and leaving your family to move here. I really appreciate you, Sister Lydia. Miss Sunshine, Sister Veronica said, and she giggled. Sister Andrew looked ready to slap her. I mean, Sister Lydia. We'd only been at their place an hour when the doorbell rang. Sister Andrew went to see who it was, and she gasped when she opened the door. Brother Carlos, what are you doing here? I noticed Drew got up in an awful hurry to go into the kitchen. From where I was sitting, I couldn't see what she was doing in there. Sister Andrew glanced back at Sister Veronica, then at me. That's our brother, Sister Veronica whispered in my ear. Mine and Sister Andrew's bio brother, I mean. Sister Andrea and her brother exchanged some hushed words, and I couldn't hear what they were saying, but I'm pretty sure it wasn't pleasant. Brother Carlos brushed past Sister Andrea and came on inside. It's true, he said to Sister Andrea. I'm here to settle it once and for all, too. No more screwing around with it. Sister Andrea looked totally lost. Sister Lydia, I wondered if maybe you could run to the store and get those snacks for the Bible study tonight? Maybe some drinks, too, while you're there. We sort of need to have a little family discussion. I'm terribly sorry. I got up. It's all right. No problem. I'll be back later. I grabbed my keys and went out the open front door. Somebody closed it behind me. Then the shades were drawn. I got out to the bus and was about to put the key in the ignition when I felt eyeballs on me. Aiden was sitting in the front passenger seat and nearly scared me to death when I saw him. Drive around the corner and park, he said. Where's your notebook? I dug under my seat and pulled it out. Good. He took it from me and laid it in his lap. What are you waiting for? Hurry up. We drove about two blocks west, and then Aiden instructed me to park beside this little Puerto Rican market, gift shop, movie rental, tobacco outlet place. Aiden got out, came around to my side of the bus, and opened the door. Come on, he said. I took his hand, stepped out, and shut my door. We crept up the sidewalk. Well, Aiden was walking normally and left, and left the creeping to me. I didn't know if anybody could see me or not. Isn't this eavesdropping, I had to ask. I'm not comfortable doing that. Where I come from, it's considered rude. It's just good investigative reporting, he said. We got close to the back side of the sister's apartment building. Now we have to get down and crawl over to those big windows in front. We won't be able to hear anything from back here. 
I stooped down and crawled along with Aiden walking behind me. What exactly are we whispering? What are we, what exactly are we listening for? I started to ask when I heard some glass objects smash against the living room wall. I jumped. Jeez, Aiden, what's going on in there? Keep going. Get under that window. Just as I made it, I heard the tail end of something Brother Carlos was saying. She's got to go, he shouted. Now! I looked back at Aiden. Who's got to go? He just handed me my notebook with the pen jammed down in the spiral. I opened it to a clean page and pulled the pen out. No way this is happening, we heard Sister Veronica say. How could it? Sister Drusilla, good Lord, what were you thinking? He's the one that brought over the wine, Drew said. I wrote down wine. Something bad happened. Brother Carlos let out a roar and something else shattered against the wall. Sister Andrew pleaded with him and then I think he pushed her. I heard a loud thud and she didn't say anything else after that. You whore, Brother Carlos said. You're no better than a slut on the street and don't you dare try to blame anything on me. I didn't bring you no wine. You called me. I didn't call nobody, Drew said. She sounded like she was crying. I swear to God, he came over here all on his own. You remember that Friday night back in June when I was sick and didn't go to the ladies', ladies auxiliary meeting? He came over about ten minutes after you guys left. He had a couple of bottles of wine talking about nobody will ever know. He, she broke down in sobs. It was awfully quiet in there for a minute or two. I wrote some more notes. What's going on now? I whispered to Aiden. He ducked his head through the wall and looked in. We have to move, he said. I'm squatting there under the window and looking at the lower half of his body. What are they doing? He came back out and grabbed me by the arm. Carlos is coming, he said. So we ran around to the far side of the building again. I peeked around the corner and heard the front door slam open. Brother Carlos came storming out. Sister Andrew, with her blouse disheveled and her hair going all over the place, came out right behind him. Wait, she cried, then got a hold of his shirt tail. Don't go! Drew was standing on the front step watching, I guess waiting to see what was going to happen next. Brother Carlos snatched his shirt tail out of Sister Andrew's hands. I can't believe you take her word over mine. I can't believe you. No, Sister Andrew said. Now she was crying. No, no. Sister Veronica came to the door with a cardboard box. I know he's telling the truth, she said. Yesterday some doctor called here for Sister Drusilla. I acted like I was her so he'd give me the message. I didn't know how to tell you this, Sister, but she's... Shut up, Drew shouted, and she shoved Sister Veronica down the steps. Hell with it. Sister Andrew, I'm pregnant. Yeah, you heard me. I'm knocked up. And get this, your brother's the father. Brother Carlos. Ha! Sister Andrew's jaw dropped. I'm sure mine did, too. Brother Carlos just stood there with this smug grin on his face. See, he said, what I tell you? She's a lying bitch. I looked back at Aiden in horror. What are they? Right, he said. I scribbled down, Drew's pregnant, lying bitch. Then I peeked around the corner again. Are you going to let her disgrace this ministry this way? Brother Carlos was saying. You'll all be kicked out. Sister Veronica lifted the box up over her head and marched back inside. Oh, no, we won't, Sister Andrew said, and she followed Sister Veronica in the house, bumping into Drew intentionally on her way. Brother Carlos waved at Drew. Bye-bye, little hoe dog he laughed. Then he hopped in his car and slammed the door. His window was down and he winked at her. It's been fun. He started up the car and screeched his tires all the way down the street. There was more commotion inside. I heard things crashing and falling to the floor. Drew was trying to say something, but her crying made it impossible for either Aiden or me to decipher it. Sisters Andrew and Veronica yelled at her nonstop, one thing after another. I can't remember it word for word, and I didn't write it down that way, but I did get some of it on paper. We trusted you. How could you do this to a brother? You'll burn in hell for what you've done. Whore. Liar. Tramp. Bitch. Before I knew it, Drew was stumbling down the steps with two big boxes full of stuff. The sisters were still throwing things out in the yard after her. A crystal snow globe sailed through the air and exploded on the sidewalk. Sister Andrew stood in the doorway. I could see an angry profile. I'm meeting with Sister Hannah and Brother Ken tonight about you. Don't come back. Don't ever come here again. Chapter 88 a group of the single brothers and Dalton Fisher met at one of the group houses that day to discuss possible plans to help Pastor Faust. Ken reluctantly approved the meeting, knowing Pastor Faust would probably hit the roof if he heard about it. Life in the church was supposed to go on as normal. 
Pastor Faust had said Wednesday night in service, but Ken knew the brothers were very concerned about the issue of the pro protesters and up upcoming trial over the alleged sexual abuse of Eduardo. Richard was the first one to arrive at the house, and he started the meeting soon after the others got there. We have a dilemma to face, he said to the men seated around the dining room table. Can we all agree on that? The brothers looked confused. What dilemma is that? Brian wanted to know. Richard rolled his eyes. Pastor Faust told us in service about a week ago that the reason he's in this mess is because we weren't supporting him like we should. We haven't been seeking God about it enough, and quite frankly, I'm ashamed of our pitiful attempts to be, well, to be spiritual lately. Pastor Faust was right to be mad at us. All of us. But the dilemma is, we're supposed to pray and ask God to give Pastor Faust more direction, and at the same time, Pastor Faust wants us to just carry on like it's business as usual. What should we do? Was I the only one confused by that? A brother raised his hand. I thought the business as usual bit was supposed to replace Pastor Faust's original order, request that we be more spiritual. That's the way I look at it. Some of the other brothers nodded in agreement. Has anybody asked Pastor Faust what he wants us to do? Richard asked. Have you? One of the men shot back. Richard tugged at his shirt sleeve. I was... I meant to, but I just couldn't find the time to do it. Task assignment for me was a real bear this week. Yeah, Brian said. Uh-huh. I suppose... Richard stared hard at Brian. Have you asked him, Brother Brian? Or did it just never occur to you that those two orders conflicted? What were you going to do? I can't see Pastor Faust trying to confuse us on purpose, Brian said. Maybe, I got it, maybe he meant that we have to just act like everything's fine and we keep on praying and seeking the face of God at the same time, only we can't let anybody know that's what we're doing. Richard sighed. Speculation without Pastor Faust's assistance leads us down the path of deception like he always says. Amen? Let's go ask him. How do you know he's not busy, one of the brothers asked. We'll go to the front desk and ask. It's pretty simple. The whole group was headed toward the main entrance of the church when Carl, stepping out of the limousine, called out to them. Where's the fire? The men turned around and waved. Pastor Steele, Richard cried. What are you doing here? Same as you all, I suspect, Carl approached the group on the steps. Y'all are here to offer your support to Pastor Faust. Offer your assistance. Am I right? The brothers were amazed. That's exactly right, Richard said. We thought... Carl held up a hand. We probably shouldn't bother Pastor Faust just now. He may be busy. Told you, one of the brothers mumbled to Richard. But you can come inside and talk with me, Carl offered. I know it's probably not as good, but would that be all right? The men looked at each other and nodded. Yes, sir, they said. Carl led the group into the sanctuary and shooed away the brothers who were in there cleaning. Go and find something else to do, he told them. These men have a much more important task at hand. He instructed the group to have a seat on the front center row, and he took his place on the stage behind the pulpit, just as he did in his own church. I've been made aware of the terrible things that have happened here in the past few weeks, he said. I want you to know that you have my full support, as well as of the support of every single member of the Baton Rouge congregation. Well, of course, the single brothers and I are keeping, trying to keep this thing under wraps for now. I'm fully confident that God will deal with these despicable people swiftly and severely. The brothers applauded. And there's no need to get folks in all our other congregations all worked up over a bunch of idle gossip mongers, is there? Amen, they answered. Good. I'm glad you feel that way. And just because I'm not worried that this thing won't blow over soon, that doesn't mean I'm, I'm going to leave our anointed bishop and founding pastor here to, fa to battle this thing alone. No, sir. I was just speaking to my single brothers this morning about the situation, about how... Well, we may be a long ways away from here geography-wise, but spiritually, oh boy, we've got that beautiful, unmistakable unity of spirit flowing through us. Yes, amen, Lord. And when a member of our church family is in trouble, the Lord speaks to either Pastor Faust or me, and we answer that call. Carl paced back and forth behind the pulpit, staring at his audience. He stared at them in silence for so long that the brothers began fidgeting and coughing. At the height of this uneasiness, he let, a la he let out a, ha a loud cry of, Hallelujah! Hallelujah! The brothers answered back. I feel victory here today. Yes, thank you, Jesus. Carl stopped pacing. He glared at Brian. But like I'm always telling my brothers, he said, that unity of spirit is a living, breathing thing. We have to nurture it constantly or it'll die. I'm sure Pastor Faust has told y'all that. Yes, sir, they answered. 
Excellent. Carl was still watching Brian. We can't have even one among us who doesn't keep that love, that unity of spirit in his heart at all times. Amen. Amen. The brothers followed his gaze over to Brian. Now, you know how my single brothers found out about all this malicious crap that's going on here? Do you know who put all that unnecessary fear and worry in their hearts? All it takes is one weak link to ruin the whole chain. He pointed at Brian. Brother Brian Beauchamp ran his mouth to one of my single brothers about it, and he made good and sure to give a pile of details, too. Everybody, thank your brother for spreading fear and starting gossip and rumors among all the single brothers in Baton Rouge. Thank you, Brother Brian, the man said. We expect more from you single brothers than we do from everybody else who has a place in this ministry, Carl said. Brian squirmed on the padded pew. I mean, it wouldn't have surprised me to hear that one of the ladies from y'all's church blabbed about it. Women can't seem to help themselves when it comes to gossip. <laughs> sort of like watching them try to walk by a dessert buffet and not touch anything, huh? They're worse than a bunch of kids out on the playground. But to hear that it was one, that, but to hear that it was one of y'all, shoot, it was all I could do to keep from getting getting in the flesh over that. That's inexcusable, brothers. Brian bowed his head and fought away the tears. So now, here he sits like he hasn't got a thing to do with this horrible persecution that's plaguing Pastor Faust right now. Brother Brian, I'm here to tell you that you're every bit as guilty of persecuting Pastor Faust as those no-good busybodies who started that rumor in the first place. How does it feel to hear somebody call you out for the wimp you really are? Not good, Brian managed to say. Carl put a hand up to his ear. How's that, little wimp? Sounded kind of sheepish, sheepish and pathetic to me. I said it doesn't sound good, Brian shouted, his voice cracking. All that time it sounded like a little mouse squeaking. Haven't quite made it to puberty yet, huh? We call you men of God, but it looks like a wimpy little boy managed to worm his way in here. Brian buried his ha head in his hands and sobbed. I'm sorry, I'm so sorry, Pastor Steele. I'm not the one you need to be apologizing to, Carl said. When you're part of the problem and not the solution... Well, shoot, I don't know who you need to tell how sorry you are, other than the Lord God Almighty himself. I suspect he already knows you're sorry, though. He stifled a snicker. <laughs> We've all known you were sorry for years, brother. Brian stood up and raised his hands toward the ceiling. God, please forgive me. God, please. That's enough, Carl said. Sit down. Brian immediately took his seat again. We don't need men like Brother Brian associated with us. Sitting right down there on that pew with you is the most amazing display of a bad, a bad testimony that I think I've ever seen. Brother Brian, if you're any kind of a man, you'll get up and leave this sanctuary and never set foot in it again. If you really care about your brothers and sisters of the faith and want to see them stay on that straight and narrow path of glory, you'll get up right now. Hold on, a voice boomed from the back of the sanctuary. Even without a microphone, it was impressive. Pastor Faust, Carl said. What a wonderful surprise. We were... Pastor Faust was making his way down one of the aisles. What do you think you're doing in here with my boys? Carl bowed down in instinctively as Pastor Faust quickly approached the foot of the stage. Those brothers were... I think they were on the way up to your office when Brother Stewart dropped me off at the main entrance. I just happened to see them and I asked if... Shut up, Pastor Faust shouted. He turned back to his brothers who looked ready to either burst into flames or fly away any second. Y'all go on about your business. I don't care where you go, but get out of my sanctuary. The men scurried away quickly. And close the doors on your way out. Pastor Faust turned back to Carl as the doors to the main entrance clicked shut. The sound resonated through the room for several seconds. You've got some nerve coming in my church and talking to my men like that, Pastor Faust said as he climbed the stairs up onto the stage. And what made you think you even had a right to come here without asking me first? I heard... And don't think about giving me all that line of bull that you were concerned about me either. Save that bleeding heart crap for your congregation. I came to see if you're ready to ask for my help yet. Pastor Faust grabbed him by the arm. Come on. He led Carl down the steps and up the aisle. We're going to my office. He was just about to open the door that led out into the fellowship hall. Smile like you mean it, Judas. Pastor Faust swung the door wide open. Several brothers were hanging around by the front window and jumped when the door slammed into the rubber stop on the wall. Look who's here, Pastor Faust said with a smile. Pastor Carl Steele has come to pay us an unexpected visit. Say hello, boys. Hello, Pastor Steele, the brothers answered quickly. None of them had been in the sanctuary to hear his speech a few minutes er earlier. 
Sorry he can't stay and visit right now, Pastor Faust said, steering Carl down the hall toward the elevator. Pastor Steele and I have some important business to discuss. Don't we, Pastor Steele? He removed his hand from Carl's arm and clamped it down hard on his right shoulder. Oh, yes, sir, very important business. Yes. At that, Pastor Faust walked him down to the elevator and pushed the button. The brothers looked on in bewilderment until the two men got on the elevator and disappeared. Pastor Faust got Carl in his office and locked the door. Sit down. Carl took a seat facing, facing Pastor Faust's desk. I don't mind telling you that the last thing I needed to hear when I was showing my lawyers to the to the front door was you ranting and raving in my own sanctuary. This trial's going to be hard enough without my lawyers having to hear you carrying on like a dang lunatic down there. Carl wasn't sure whether he should respond to that or not. This is still my church, understand? At least I think this is my church. Let me make this perfectly clear. You have no right, no right to come up here and speak to anyone without my say-so. Nobody. You were just a strung-out sewer rat when I found you, and without me and all the things I've done for you, you'd still be down there in Norfolk peddling your nickel bags on the street. Or have you also forgotten that in the midst of all that? He waved his hands abstractly in the air. All that nice stuff. Your big fancy church. Huh? Carl was still wearing his fake smile. You know I'll always be indebted to you for what you did, but you had nothing to do with what came after... There wouldn't have been an after without a before, would there, Pastor Faust said. I made that choice, Carl said, sitting up straighter. I made the choice, I did the work, and everything from here on out I've earned. Pastor Faust leaned back in his chair. Why'd you choose that anyway? With what you had, I figured you'd have... Let's say I thought your aspirations would have been a bit more grand. Grandiose. Napoleonic. They're grander than you know, Carl whispered to, to Denali, who laughed softly. What'd you say? I only have a servant's heart, Pastor, just like you. I care about the little people. That's not what you said, Carl just smiled. Pastor Faust stood up and leaned over the desk. Don't play with me. Carl rose up and leaned in about three inches away from Pastor Faust's face. I didn't come here for a showdown. I'm here because you need help, and at this point... I'm the only one who can help you. Pastor Faust didn't budge. Anybody that does what you just did downstairs couldn't be too much help to me. Sounds like you need to get some help yourself. Maybe a few shots of Haldol a week could fix that little anger problem you've got. And you're say you're, you say you're here to help me? All that yelling and screaming in the sanctuary where God and everybody could hear you didn't help me one daggone bit. I had to tell the lawyers you were just running through a training exercise with the men on how to deal with hard recruits. Sounded more like boot camp in there than anything you'd hear in a house of God. Parading attorneys around, having your name in all the papers for playing with little boys, seeking protesters out on the streets. What's a little rebuking in the name of the Lord going to hurt? Come on, Denali said to Pastor Faust. Calm yourself a little bit and hear what Carl has to say. Trust me, he's here to help you. Help me, Pastor Faust said. What? Carl asked, un unaware that Denali had said anything. Nothing. Look, just don't come in here and make a big scene again, okay? I run the show here, and I can't have you coming in and doing stuff like that. Carl sat back down. Honest, I didn't come up here to chew anybody out. But you know how it is, don't you? One of your brothers gets out of line, and you gotta call him on it right then and there. He'll think his behavior is okay from then on if you don't. And the more people that there are to hear it, the better. Keeps them from getting their own ideas, amen? <sighs> Amen, Pastor Faust said with a sigh as he sat back down. Oh, my heart. I'm getting too old for this. So, but what business would you have doing it to, what, what business would you have doing it to a brother here? Who are you fussing at anyway? Brother Brian Beauchamp ran his mouth to one of my brothers about, you know, about what's been going on here. Now all the single brothers know about it. I had to talk to all of them this morning, and that was no fun task, believe me. Who else down there knows? Nobody, as far as I can tell, but you know we won't be able to keep it secret for long. Yeah, well, Aiden's been no help there, Pastor Faust said. If I want to get out of this mess, I'm going to have to do it myself. What can I do, Carl asked. I'm here to see if there's anything I can do to help you out. And as you said, I do owe you one, or two or three. You could start by making this whole ugly thing go away. Well, now, I don't know if I can do that. 
Well, what good are you then? Denali told me to get Aiden to take care of it. Aiden keeps dodging me left and right, and you know the cops and child welfare aren't on my side. They aren't as objective as they should be, Carl said. Denali cleared his throat. <clears throat> you know, Charles, sometimes the angels have to do things that seem to be really bad to you, to you people at first, but when it's all said and done, you realize what the long-range plan was. You find, out it wasn't, you find out it wasn't so bad after all. All you angels know how to do is talk in circles, Pastor Faust huffed. You use a lot of pretty words and flowery talk, but you never actually make any kind of a point. Maybe we should have become pastors, Denali said. Now that's plain vulgar talk. Carl, if you really want to help me... Lord, I don't even want to think about that. Think about what? Carl asked eagerly. What is it, Pastor Faust? Aiden has told me one thing. He said this thing's going to get worse before it gets any better. I don't know exactly what that means, but if I have to ask you to take over the church... Yes, Carl answered. I do it in a heartbeat. As long as you needed me to, I swear. Hang on a minute, Pastor Faust said. They haven't locked me up just yet, so quit racing your motor. Let me finish. If things don't go well and they actually do convict me, would you come manage my congregation? We both know I wouldn't be gone for long. It just never hold up in appeals. I'd do it. Now, I'm not chomping at the bit for them to come take you away and throw you in prison or anything, and hopefully it'll never come to that. But yes, I'll be here when you need me, if you need me. And there's nothing you can get Denali to do, Pastor Faust asked. Carl looked back at Denali, and Denali shook his head. I'm sorry. Pastor Faust rubbed his, fa rubbed his face with a handkerchief. God, the people in this ministry would go all to pieces if anything happened to me. There'd be a riot. Yes, sir, Carl said. We'd all be very upset to see anything bad happen to you. And I could, le I could lead those lost sheep of yours in the right direction. They'd need guidance to stay on track and help you out. And I'm just the one to take that job if you ever were to... Well, if you weren't here to do it. We'd contact the media, the NAACP. You know what a champion you've been of their causes all these years. We'd get you right back where you belong. Behind that desk, behind that pulpit, and keeping this church on course. Pastor Faust flat laughed. Your speeches get fuller of flap every year, don't they? I mean it. Your place is here. This is what you sacrificed everything for. Nobody knows that better than I do. I don't know what Aiden is or isn't doing for you in this situation, but when, if the time comes that you need me to come take your place, call me. I don't care if it's two o'clock in the morning. You call me up and my men and I will come running. Pastor Faust stood up and shook his hand. Thank you, Carl. Let's just pray you never have to. Carl smiled and grasped Pastor Faust's hand. I'll always be right there for you. As Denali looked on with pleasure, Carl leaned over the desk and pulled Pastor Faust into a tight, warm embrace. I love you, brother. Don't ever forget that. Chapter 89 I watched Drew trudge down the street until she went around a corner out of sight. What do we do now? I asked Aiden, who was watching her too. Let's go get the bus. We'll catch up with her. Where do you think she's going? Come on, we have to run. I thought I'd have more endurance and lung capacity after not smoking for two years, but I was still huffing and puffing by the time we got back to where he told me to park. I would have joined a gym or something, but that was considered worldly and vain in the church. With all the church activities you were expected to attend and be a part of, there wasn't time for it anyway. Go down the street, Aiden said, pointing at the road to our right out of the parking lot. She should be crossing right in front of us by the time we get there. I started up the bus and pulled out of there as fast as I could, and just like he said, she was coming to the intersection right when I reached the, so the stop sign. She glanced at me, looked back down at her boxes, looked up again, and ran across the road in front of me. Wait, I yelled out my open window. Hang on a minute. Tell her to get in, Aiden said. I'll climb in the back seat. Come get in, I called out. She looked at me for a minute, then walked over the driver's side door. I don't think you want me in there, she said, nodding at the bus. Why not? She let out a disgusted laugh. Trust me, you don't. Get in anyway. Don't worry about it. She opened the sliding door and dumped her two boxes of stuff right on Aiden, so I guess she couldn't see him sitting there. She must not have been able to hear him either, because when he told me to take her to my apartment, she didn't react. I told her to come inside after we parked around back. You have no idea what just happened back at my house, she said. Truly, you don't want to be seen with me right now. It'll be fine, I told her. Just come with me. 
You can leave your boxes in the bus. I'll lock the doors. Nobody will mess with them. Don't you want to know why I'm carrying all this stuff? We'll discuss it once we get upstairs. She got out and followed me inside. I noticed she started running up the steps when we got to the floor where Sister Esther's apartment was. I couldn't get my apartment unlocked and open fast enough for her. Hurry up, she said as I fidgeted with the key. Once we got inside, she slouched down on the sofa and looked up at me. Aiden took a seat on a stool in the kitchen area. Tell her it's okay if she wants to cry. If you feel like crying, I said, though it sounded weird, it'll, it'll be perfectly all right. When Drew heard that, she just busted out in sobs. I am so mad, she said. I hate it when I get mad because then I start crying and I can't help it. I do the same thing, I told her. I don't know what causes that. Overwhelming emotion, I guess. It is sort of irritating, though. It's like totally not what you're trying to express. Aiden shushed me. I handed her a Kleenex. I can't believe what just happened, she said. I mean, I knew they'd find out sooner or later, but to just... Just what? I asked, like I didn't already know. Maybe she should start at the beginning, Aiden suggested. I brought your notebook in. I'll put it over on the table here and you can come get it. She won't mind if you take notes. I casually wandered over to the little table in the kitchen and picked up the notebook. How do you know she won't have a problem with it, I whispered. Aiden just gave me a look and a push back into the living room. Tell me what happened, I said, and I patted her arm. I sat on the sofa beside her and opened the notebook to a clean page. I know you're upset. Start at the beginning if you can. Well, Drew said, sniffling. Back last June, Brother Carlos... Do you know Brother Carlos? That's as Sister Andrew and Sister Veronica's bio brother, right? Right. This one night last June, there was some ladies' auxiliary meeting or something at the church, and I didn't go because I had strep throat or something, and I swear it wasn't ten minutes after they left that he came knocking on the door. He must have been watching for him to leave the house. What did he want? He came up there with two bottles of Boone's Farm and he, want, he and said he wanted to just hang out with me for a while. You know, because the brothers aren't supposed to drink or anything. Doing it with me, he knew he probably wouldn't get caught. And I said that was cool with me. You know, whatever. Don't think I'm a skank or nasty or anything, but me and him had done that before in the past. Maybe two or three times in the past. And we'd been drinking for a while, and the next thing I know, I'm drunk as hell. Oh, God, excuse me for that. It's all right, I said. So I'm drunk, and I told him I wasn't feeling too good, and he said I ought to go in Sister Andrew's room and lay down. Well, girl, he followed me back there and starts kissing me all over my neck, and the next thing I know, our clothes went flying off, and we were on Sister's, Sister Andrew's bed uh, going at it. I'm sorry for the way I'm talking, but that's what really happened. I'm so pissed off right now. It's okay, really, I said. I wrote down everything she said as fast as I could. You just keep going. What happened next? So we got done in there, and I think he left not too long after that. I must have gotten up and gotten in my own bed, because that's where I was when I woke up in the morning, and the sisters didn't say a single word to me about it. I guess Brother Carlos took the empty wine bottles with him. I didn't throw up or get a hangover or anything. Why did you do that? Drew sighed. Girl, I don't know. It just gets so damn boring when all you ever get to do is go to ladies' auxiliary meetings, go to Bible studies, go to church, blah, blah, blah. Shoot, you've been here long enough to see that. So when the brothers used to call me up at work or come by the house when nobody else was there, or the sisters are asleep talking about, uh, talking about let's go out or screw or get drunk or whatever, I was all about it. Beats the hell out of having to be around a bunch of backstabbing bitches every night, you know? But... I started to say, are you serious about the brothers doing that? Brothers in our church? And why be a part of the ministry if you're doing stuff like that? It flies in the face of everything Pastor Faust teaches. Why didn't you just leave the church? My cousin would freak out if I told him I didn't want to go to church no more. He went to a lot of trouble to get me here, and Pastor Faust was the one that got me in that apartment with Sister Andrew and Sister Veronica in the first place. He said he didn't want me to stay there. He said he wanted me to stay there because they'd be good role models for me. So Brother Stewart would freak. But if you don't mind me asking, what did you need good role models for? There are single sisters in the church who don't live with other sisters. Yeah, but not many. And Pastor Faust tries to get them all living together whenever he can. He's even talked about building group homes for us like what the brothers have. I know he approached you about living with the sisters too, right? 
Yeah, he did, actually. I wrote, P.F. thought I needed role models. See, when I came to Dalton Fisher, Drew said, Brother Stewart was the only person I knew. I knew. He came to Pen- he came to Pennsylvania to get me when I was 17. That was like three years ago. My mom had told him, or somebody told him, that I'd been hanging out with some bad people and I needed to get out of there before I screwed up my life worse than it already was. So Brother Stu- Stewart came and got me and brought me here. He caught all kinds of hell for it from Pastor Faust and Brother Ken, too, girl. Why is that? Pastor Faust said I was like a bad seed or something. She paused and looked down at her hands. He never gave Stuart permission to go get me and bring me here. But Stuart was like, Look, Pastor Faust, you're always telling us to go out and minister and bring in the lost sheep, save souls and all that. My cousin needs help, and if bringing her here can help her, then that's what I'm going to do. I mean, girl, he stood up to the man just like that. Pastor Faust said he'd disfellowship Stuart and throw all his stuff out, but Stuart said he was just doing what he was just doing what God had led him to do and I guess that was enough because Pastor Faust never did throw out his stuff didn't dif- didn't disfellowship him either I think it just shocked the hell out of him for one of the single brothers to actually step up to him like that but how is it that these other brothers started coming around and asking you to go do all that stuff I guess word just gets around about who likes to party it didn't take long either I think the first time I did anything like that was maybe a couple of weeks after I moved here Get back to what happened between Drew and Brother Carlos, Aiden said. She's giving you information about things you don't need to know right now. What about Brother Carlos, I said to Drew. So y'all had a little run-in and the sisters never found out about it. Well, they didn't find out till today. That's what I'm so pissed off about. Tell me what happened. She started crying again, so I got the box of Kleenex off the television and put it on the couch between us. I didn't do that again with anybody after that night, she said, and it had been at least a month and a half since the last time I did it, and it was with Brother Carlos then, too. She glanced up at me. Okay, so when my period was late, I got really scared. You know, I didn't want to find out if I was pregnant. Like, if you don't know, you won't be. But I finally went to the doctor last week, and I found out I was. That must have been terrible. The damn doctor called the house, and when I found out... What I found out today after you left was that Sister Veronica answered the phone and acted like she was me. So the doctor told her, yeah, you're pregnant. I acted surprised. Drew, oh my God. I was already pretty sure I was. I bought one of those home pregnancy tests at the store and did it at work. It came up positive, but I didn't know how accurate those things were, so I went to the doctor to find out for sure. I told him not to call me at home, but they did anyway. When are you due? I don't know. I only went to the doctor about all the nausea and to get that test done. I don't have time to wait for the re- I didn't have time to wait for the results because I didn't want to be late for work. So they said they'd call me and let me know. I swear I gave them my work number to call. Maybe I didn't. Who knows? Okay, so Sister Veronica knew you were pregnant. Then what? Then today, Brother Carlos comes to the house. Well, you were there when he came by because Sister Andrew sent you off to the store. He comes in there acting all big and bad, telling the sisters I called him over there and seduced him that night. And he said I was going around telling everybody in the church I was pregnant and that he raped me or whatever. And I know I only told one person I was pregnant. And that's the sig- that's the single sister in one of the other groups. I guess she ran her damn mouth about it. And the rumors got started. And then somebody went to Brother Carlos and told him that I was supposedly running around telling everybody. But he came to you, I said. Right. And you're not lying to me. Hell no. Why would I lie about something like this? But see, since nobody over here likes me anyway because of Pastor Faust did, because Pastor Faust didn't want me here, they'll take Brother Carlos's word over mine. And you said there are other brothers who come to you for the same thing. Oh, when they can, yeah. And you're telling me the truth about that too, right? Drew sighed in frustration. Why would I lie? Honest to God, everything I've told you is true. That shit really happened. Do you think they come to you because... And please don't take offense to this because I'm just asking... They come to you because so many people in the ministry have so little regard for you? Maybe because Pastor Faust didn't want you here, like you said? I never thought about it like that, but I guess it's possible. They wouldn't go up to somebody like Sister Andrew and try that. Shoot, she'd knock them into next week. I'm not saying that's necessarily why they came to you. Maybe people don't really feel that way about you at all. Oh, they do, she said. Especially the sisters, and they let me know it every chance they get. And Sister Andrew and Sister Veronica didn't know you were going out and doing those things before today? 
They might have heard the rumors, and then one time they asked me about it a month after I moved here. What'd you tell them? I told them I wasn't. So you lied to them. Dog, girl, what else could I do? I didn't want to get kicked out of here and have Stuart pissed at me. I remembered the way Sister Andrew looked at her when we were under the tent at the conference two years earlier. How she talked to me as she glared at her. Christian fellowship is so important to us ladies. Good Christian fellowship, I mean. It's too easy for us to backslide without it. I quickly scribbled that memory down in the margin of the page I was on in the notebook. So they didn't know for sure, I said. No way. They would have run my ass out into the street. But now they know, and there's no doubt. What did Brother Carlos say after I left the apartment? I think you were there when he said something like he was going to settle the thing once and for all. Yeah, I heard that, I said. After you left, Brother Carlos started telling them about the rumors that were going around, and they both said and they both said they'd heard some of the stuff, but they thought it was just gossip since I wasn't in, I said I wasn't involved in nothing like that. They always thought they kept me too busy with the sisters and doing stuff in the church for me to have time to do any of that stuff. And then Sister Andrew asked me if if what Brother Carlos was saying was true. I told her it wasn't, but she took Bar Brother Carlos's word over mine. He said, I called him to come over like I needed his help with something. The power was off or whatever, and then when he got there, I got him drunk and seduced him. Good Lord, I said. Then he started yelling, talking about I needed to go, get out of the house, take my things and get out. Then he threw this big vase up against the wall. He busted a lamp and pushed Sister Andrew down on the floor when she tried to get him to calm down. Sister Andrew just couldn't believe it at first, but, when she, got, but she got over real quick after that and started agreeing with him. The next thing I know, Brother Carlos goes out the front door, and Sister Andrew's following right behind him. She called me a whore and a tramp, called me a bitch, all kinds of things, and he said I better not ever blame him for what went on. Believe me, I tried to tell the sisters what really happened, but they thought I was, I was all lying to them and shit. She was getting mad again. Why would I make up a bunch of lies like that, she said. How in the hell could they stand there and believe that? Hell, I'm still pregnant, and I damn sure didn't get that way by myself. He's got at least some blame in this, no matter whose story you believe. So Brother Carlos and Sister Andrew went outside. What happened then? Sister Andrew was out there begging Brother Carlos not to leave. I don't know why. Maybe she thought he was too mad and would have an accident or whatever. I went and stood on the front steps to see what was going on. Then Sister Veronica came out and started to yell, started to tell him she acted like she was me on the phone when the doctor called, but I stopped her before she could tell him I was pregnant. I wanted to be the one to say it. And I did, too. I'm pregnant, and Brother Carlos is the father. God, it felt so good to tell those stuck-up, phony-ass bitches that. Drew blew her nose. Then Brother Carlos said they shouldn't disgrace the ministry by letting me stay there. He said they'd be disfellowshipped along with me if they let me stay. So then they went back inside and started throwing all my stuff in those two boxes I was carrying. Who's they, I asked. Did Brother Carlos go back inside? God, girl, that was the worst part. He goes and gets in his car, all cool and shit, and he winks at me and goes, It's been fun, just like that. And then he drove off. So I'm just about to go crazy, and I go back inside, and there the sisters are, throwing my stuff around and breaking whatever they can. I had this little crystal figurine collection my mom gave me, you know, and they busted them all to shit on the floor. I mean, they did it with me standing right there watching. And what they couldn't break, they threw in those two boxes. Talking about, how does it feel to know you'll burn in hell for what you did? And stuff like that. Trying to make me feel guilty or whatever. Sister Anna said she's going to talk to Brother Ken and Sister Hannah tonight and get me kicked out of the church. And that I couldn't ever go back to their house again. I had just left there when you saw me. God, I really don't know what to say. Well, there ain't much to say, she said. Do you see now why I said you don't want to be seen with me? They'd freak out if they knew I was up here with you. What are you going to do now? Shoot, I don't know. I guess I'll see if I can find a room somewhere. I could probably get my mom to send me some money. I sure as hell ain't asking Stuart for any. Not right away, I'm not. What do you think he'll say when he finds out? I don't look forward to that at all. He may kill me. It make me wish I was dead, at least. I looked around my apartment. Maybe you could stay here a day or two. Oh, no way. I'm not going to bring you into all this. People talk. Like that Sister Esther downstairs? If she saw me hanging out around here, she'd get you in a ton of trouble with Pastor Faust. Yeah, I sighed. But this is just such an awful situation for you. 
I believe what you say, and it's like you're suffering all the punishment for something that wasn't totally your fault. I'm not condoning your behavior, but you weren't the only one who did wrong here. Now you have nowhere to go, nobody to help you out. I just hate this for you, Drew. I really do. She gave me a half-hearted smile. Nah, it's cool. I'll be all right. I know how to take care of myself. I'm just going to rent a motel room or something until I can find another place to stay. And to tell you the truth, I'm glad it's finally all out in the open. I didn't know how it'd come out or what would happen when it did, but it's worked out pretty good for me. How are you going to take care of this baby? You know, you can go after Brother Carlos for child support. I don't know if I'll try to do that. I think I want to keep him out of me and my baby's life, you know? I was pretty freaked out when I first thought I was pregnant, but now I'm sort of looking forward to it. And I can take the baby with me on my routes when it's after it's born, too. Oh, well, that's right. You work with the school bus folks. Ryder, yeah. And I've got some friends at work who'd probably let me stay with them if I had to. Like if I couldn't afford my own place or whatever. Sister Andrew said she was going to talk to Sister Hannah and Brother Ken. What do you think they'll do? Huh? Oh, that was just something that was supposed to scare me. They do that all the time when they're about to kick somebody out. Like somebody will come up to you and tell you they're going to talk to Brother Ken or Pastor Faust or whoever. And they hope... And they hope you'll come, you won't come around to make trouble if you know that. Like you're supposed to be all scared or something. They won't be able to find me anyway, girl. They don't have to worry about me going back to that place. I ain't got a damn bit of use for those people. Shoot. And Stuart can get mad if he wants to. But just like you said, I wasn't the only one who had anything to do with me getting pregnant. And he, need, he needs to go back and get mad at Carlos. Are you going back to the doctor anytime soon? I guess I'll have to find a... What do you call them? Baby doctors? Obstetricians, I said. You'd probably want to go to a gynecologist first. That'd be my initial thought if I were in your position. I don't know, though. I've never gone through what you're... I mean, I've never found myself... Drew laughed. You ain't got to worry about hurting my feelings. It's going to be all right, Sister Lydia. I glanced over at Aiden to see what I should do next. That's good enough for now, he said. Let her go on about her business. Take her wherever she wants to go. Drew said sisters Andrew and Veronica didn't put any of her clothes in the boxes, and she wondered if I could take her somewhere to get some pants and shirts. She said she didn't have much money. I thought of the Good Hope thrift store right away. I know where we need to go, I told her. Come on. We went back down to the bus, and Aiden got in the back seat again. Where are we going, Drew wanted to know. I ain't going to be able to buy much, whatever it is. I think I got about $20. She dug around in her pants pocket and pulled out a wad of $1 bills. Don't worry about it, I said. I'll take care of it. It's the social worker in me. I forgot you used to do that. Sister Andrew told me when you first came up here, uh, but she said to keep it a secret. You probably got in the habit of not bringing it up too much around anybody in the church. Yeah, Sister Andrew let me know back before I moved here that that wouldn't be too cool with some of the stuff Pastor Faust th has been through. Drew started to say something else along those lines, but I changed the subject before she could get the words out. Have you ever been to the Good to Hope thrift store before? The Good Hope what? It's this thrift store up here in, on Grand, on the right-hand side of the road, going like you're heading to Fisher. They got pretty cool stuff. That junk store? No. Why would I go there? Do you like the clothes you see me wear? Yeah, they're nice. I'd say probably 95% of them came from this store and one just like it back home. Most of my outfits were less than ten, $15, not including shoes and underwear. I was so proud. We pulled into the parking lot. She looked at the building and made a face. It looks like shit. Can't we go to the mall or something? If you've got $20 and no place to live, you can't afford the mall. You'll be able to get maybe one sock and half of a bra, but that'd be it. She looked down like she was ashamed, and it made me mad at myself. I'm sure there was a better way I could have put it. Let's just go in and look around, I said. If you don't like any of the stuff they've got, we'll see where else we can go. Maybe we could try Walmart or Target or something. I think I'll wait in the bus, Aiden said. I have no need for polyester jumpsuits today. Drew started to get out, then hesitated. What if there's somebody from the church in there? You don't want them to see me with you. Quit worrying about me. I doubt anybody in the church with any authority over me will be caught dead in this place. And you and I both know you've got enough drama in your life right now to keep you occupied without having to think about what anybody else sees or thinks about me. We had a blast in there. Drew got several shirts, some pants, and a purse that I thought was hideous, but she went crazy for it. I don't remember if I bought anything or not. 
I think I spent most of my time driving the shopping cart around and pointing her to different sections of the store. We even found some maternity clothes in there that she liked. Drew said something like, I've got to remember this place when we first got in line to check out, but I wasn't really paying attention. I was watching the cashier and the receipts she handed out. What are you looking at? She finally said when I didn't respond to something else she said. Help me watch and see if any of those receipts have a big red star on the back. I strained, I strained to look at the cashier as the cashier handed a customer her change and receipt. I couldn't see the back of it from where I was. The customer shoved it all in her pocket and scurried off with her bags. Dang it, I said. What's the problem? <laughs> Look up there. I pointed to this big sign on the wall above the cashier's head. Drew read it out loud. Find a red star on your register tape and get $5 off your next purchase. Hey, that's pretty cool. It's cool, all right. I've never gotten it, though. Not yet. Hey, does that cashier look like a lupe to you? A what? Nothing. I'm such an idiot. It's almost our turn. Let's get these clothes off the hangers. Saves time. I swear to God, Drew got that freaking red star. I let her have it since the clothes were hers, and she could go back some other time and save $5 on whatever she decided to buy. And if I was going to get that red star, it'd be, it'd be when I was in there buying my own stuff. Drew tried to give me her $20, but I told her to keep it. I even gave her some extra money and drove her to the Motel 6 in Fisher. We were standing in the motel parking lot when I wrote my home phone number down on the back of the Good Hope receipt. Here, I handed it to her. Call me if you need anything or if you just feel like talking to somebody. I've got an answer machine, so if I'm not there, leave me a message and I'll call you back. I didn't expect it, but she reached out and hugged me. She teared up again. You are so cool, she said. I really appreciate everything you did for me today. It's nothing honest, I said, and I mean it. Call me if you need me. Chapter 90. Liddy hopped back in the bus at the motel. Well, that's over, she said. Over for now, anyway. I can't believe she's pregnant. Baby doctor. God, she has no idea what she's in for. Now where are we going? <laughs> no response. She looked in the back seat, but no one was there. Aiden? Aiden, where'd you go? Aiden had gone back to the church to see what was going on. Pastor Faust had just finished with Carl and Denali when he got there. You're awfully pale, Aiden said as he breezed through the open door to Pastor Faust's office. Have you eaten anything today? You know, you have to be careful about your blood sugar levels. Diabetes can be a real... I want a straight answer, Pastor Faust said. No more beating around the bush. A straight answer about what? Why don't you do anything about these... The protesters in Eduardo. All that unnecessary crap that's been going on. And don't tell me it's something beyond your control again. I've seen you do too much supernatural hocus-pocus to believe that. Charles, you know I hate this situation as much as you do, but really, I can't stop it. Pastor Faust came up out of his seat. You're lying. Either stop lying to me or get out. Well, I've put some color back in your cheeks. Shut up. Close that door. <clears throat> Aiden turned and shut the office door. Have you even thought to check your blood sugar today? You know what Dr. Spellman said about that. I don't care about my stupid about any stupid blood sugar right now, Pastor Faust said. He pulled a jar of grape jelly out of one of his desk drawers and started eating it with a spoon. Here's what I think about blood sugar. Fine, it's your life. Abuse it however you please. Answer my question, and this time I want the truth. I can't stand here and watch you eat grape jelly like that and think a thought all the way through, Aiden said. It's disgusting. Pastor Faust slapped the lid back on the jar and set it aside. I've told you already, there's nothing I can do for you, Charles. What more do you want? Would you prefer for me to tell you what you want to hear? Comfort you with promises that this will all be over with tomorrow? That the sun will rise in the morning and find your life in perfect order? It won't change anything if I do, but if that's what you want, I'll be more than happy to oblige. Carl was here this afternoon while you were out roaming the countryside. Really? I had no idea he was planning a trip up here. We could have used your help, but as always, you were nowhere to be found. Carl said I can call on him if I find myself in a... If I ever need him to take over the church for a little while. That was awfully nice of him, Aiden said. Yeah, well, we're both going to make sure that's never necessary, aren't we? I'm going to do everything within my power to manage this situation, Charles. <clears throat> Pastor Faust held his hand up. I almost forgot the best part. I had called Brother Stewart to bring the car around. 
Carl staying through tomorrow and needed a ride to the hotel, and this man came to the front window downstairs. Brother Rich brought him up here. What was this man here for? See for yourself. Pastor Faust unfolded some papers that had been sitting on his desk. Do you know what this is? Aidan took the papers and briefly looked over them. It's a subpoena. You dang right it is. I have to appear in court a week from Monday. And do you know how many times those child welfare morons came by to actually discuss this with me? Try to get my side of the story? I have no idea, Charles. Not one single time. Not once. I can't believe they'd take the word of a spoiled brat little 15-year-old boy over mine. Didn't they talk to you when they came to get Eduardo? There was some lady with the police, but she didn't have a lot to say to me before they snatched Eduardo out of my own home. The lady didn't ask me a single question, so all they had to go on was a phone call Eduardo made to the police station. Said he called 911 and was scared to death about having to live with me permanently. Now tell me what kind of a world we live in where a kid who's mad about having to go someplace can just call the cops and they take his word for what supposedly happened over mine. Aren't we still in America? Aiden took a seat on the edge of Pastor Faust's desk. I have to say, that does sound a little strange. Do you know if they did a medical examination, look for any physical evidence? All I know is they got the call sometime late Saturday morning. I should have known I couldn't leave that boy alone anywhere. And they came to the house this Saturday afternoon, got his clothes and stuff, and took him to some foster home. They had a restraining order for me, too. I can't go anywhere near him. I've never heard of anything like that, Aiden said. Yeah? Just wait till the protesters found out, find out if they don't know already. They'll have a field day with that, whether anything ever actually happened or not. They won't wait to find out the truth. Pastor Faust looked up at Aiden. Do you think it'll be in the papers? Stuff about the trial? (coughs) Aiden sighed. It's a pretty sensational story. You have to know that. If they can, the newspapers will be all over it. What about TV reporters? Them too, I'm sorry to say. That's it, Pastor Faust said, and he stood up again. I'm not going to prison because of one little spoiled, rotten kid. I left him up there with Ray and Helen too long, and they ruined him because they couldn't have any kids of their own. He sees something he wants, and then he cries till he gets it. But that won't fly down here. I need to talk to my lawyers again. Aiden watched him as he talked. You need something to take your mind off all this. I can at least do that for you. If you can't take care of this problem, I'm not interested in anything you can do for me. I've already accepted the fact that you either can't or won't help me. So go do whatever you want to. I don't care. You've been pretty much useless for the last six months or so anyway. (laughs) No, listen. How about letting Sister Lydia interview you again? You two can talk about the good old days. She can learn more about the wonderful, brilliant man you are. All that good stuff. How about it? Tell her to come by after service tomorrow morning, Pastor Faust said, waving Aiden away. After that, you and I will sit down and have ourselves a little chat. Your wish is my command. Chapter 91 I felt a little weird about going back over to Sister Andrews after I left Drew at the motel, and Aiden wasn't there to tell me what to do one way or another. I drove back to my apartment, went upstairs, flopped down on the couch, and somehow the phone book ended up in my hands. It was a pathetic, sickly little thing, only slightly larger than one you'd find for Troy back home. I flipped over to the yellow pages to the church's section, and I smiled when I saw the full-page ad for the open arms. Pastor Faust's picture took up half the page. I guess word just gets around about who likes to party, I remembered. That can't be, I said out loud, still staring at Pastor Faust's portrait. There's no way that really happens. Not in this ministry, anyway. I stopped myself. What did I got in the phone book out for, anyway? I knew I needed to at least call Sister Andrew in case they'd recovered from their little episode with Brother Carlos and Drew enough to wonder why I'd been gone so long. I'll be glad when Pastor Faust gets us pagers like he got all the single brothers, I said as I dialed Sister Andrew's number. That way we can all keep up with what everybody else is doing, and Pastor Faust will know. Nobody was answering the phone, and the answering machine didn't pick up either. If I'd been thinking clearly, I would have called the church to at least let whoever was banning the phones know where I was. (laughs) I looked at the clock. It was still another good three hours before the evening Bible study. I desperately wanted a nap, and my body gravitated toward the couch again. Stop, I shouted. I command you in the name of the Lord, slothful demons of the flesh, stop. It was a technique they, a technique they taught everybody in the church within their first month there. Pastor Faust called it the, spiritual, the spirit wake-up call. 
but amongst the parishioners it was called thought stopping. I had read about it when I was a psych major at UNC Wilmington, but I wasn't thinking about that at the time. The way it was explained to me in the ministry, Satan uses all sorts of sneaky tactics to get you to fall away from church activities. Taking a nap when you could be out ministering or fellowshipping was a good example. Shouting stop is an effective way to scare those thoughts out of your head, and I was getting pretty good at it. You can even shout it in your mind if you're really talented. After I shouted at my desire to get some sleep that afternoon, I wasn't sleepy anymore. Praise the Lord. No victory for you, Satan, I said. I'm going I'm going to that Vivian lady's house just like Aiden said I could. Stand back, Lucifer. I'm on a mission for a true man of God, and you won't stop me. I grabbed my keys and went out the back door and went back out the door. It was strange seeing Dalton again after my weird little trip to it, into it the day before. There were different buildings, obviously, since almost the entire town had to be re rebuilt after the tornado. I was really hungry and thought about stopping somewhere to get a bite to eat, but I forged ahead to the old boarding house. I parked on the street in front of the dilapidated old building and got out. The large front lawn had me awestruck. This is where it happened, I whispered, and my eyes swept from one end of the lawn to the other. I nodded to the left. That's where all the reporters were. And to the right, Aiden was sitting right there under that tree when Pastor Faust called him. I'd gone back 27 years in my mind. <coughs> I sidestepped scraps of food and clusters of people long gone, and slowly I made my way up to the sidewalk. Then he made it rain. Oh, that felt so... Hey, you! The voice startled me, and I looked up to see where it was coming from. A withered old lady was sitting in a rocking chair on the porch, camouflaged by piles of junked appliances and cordwood. Come up here come up here to me, she said. I ain't got the strength to yell, you know. She watched my every move I made all the way up to the house, up the steps, until I stood three feet away under her from her. And then she looked down long enough to pull a Marlboro Red out of the pack and light it. Jeez, I said under my breath. Cowboy killers. What? I was, I started to say, where I come from, we used to call those things cowboy killers. Those Marlboro Reds. Well, I guess people back home still call them that, but I'm not there, so. Uh, what were you snooping around in my yard for, she asked me. That's trespassing. I'm awfully sorry about that. It just, this place looks sort of familiar to me. I'm not sure why. Probably looks like some down-home plantation house to you, she said, with this weird little grin. Makes you yearn for the past and all that. Have people picking cotton for you and what not. What part of the South are you from, anyway? I just moved up here from North Carolina. North Carolina? North... She gave into a coffin fit that nearly brought her up out of her chair. I made a move to steady her, but she managed to get it under control. I got no use for that place. Really? Why not? That Charles Faust, or whatever he calls himself, that's where he's from. Nope, got no use for a state that spits out something like him. She took a long drag off her cigarette that almost made me drool. I inhaled her secondhand smoke as deeply as I could without it being too obvious. You know him, she asked. A man named Charles Faust? Oh, yes, ma'am. I attend his church, the Open Arms. You say you go to his church? Yes, ma'am. Never mind that ma'am stuff. What's your name? Lydia Roberts. Lydia Roberts, she thought for a minute. Took another drag. Nope, can't say I've ever heard of you. When'd you move here? And why on God's earth would you come to a place like this? <laughs> I moved here about a month ago so I could be close to the ministry, I said. Ministry? Did Charles Faust send you over here? No, ma'am. I mean, no, he didn't. I came here on my... Go away. I won't talk to you. <laughs> my mind went blank. I'd blown it. Without Aiden there to coach me, I didn't know what I should and shouldn't be asking this woman, and I'd turned her against me in two minutes flat. She was about to go inside when I called out to her. Vivian, honest to God, I'm not here because Pastor Faust asked me to come. You're probably the last person he'd want me talking to, and I'd be rebuked till I couldn't see straight if he knew I was here right now. See, he didn't have too good of an opinion of you back in those days either. I'm just here to find out why that is. She turned around. How do you know my name? I know a lot of things I probably have no business of knowing, and no, Pastor Faust wasn't responsible for that either. I know he insists... Sister Faust, Mrs. Faust, Ruby used to live here back in the 70s when you still took in boarders. 
Right here is where he made his big speech the day after the tornado and fed all those people with one bag of food from Penny's Cafe. You stood right here on this porch and watched him heal Brother Ken Thomas's foot and help a little cripple girl walk again. You and Pastor Faust didn't approve of each other back then, and to the best of my knowledge, you still don't. Now, I've, now I've told you that Pastor Faust didn't send me here, and I got nothing against you whatsoever. I'd just like to hear your side of the story on what happened between you two way back then. Do you mind if we talk about that? She stood in the doorway and studied me some more. What is it you're really after? Just what I... You're not going to convince me to go to that so-called church, you know, no matter what you say. I'm not here for that. I just want to find out what happened between you and Pastor Faust. I swear. I don't feel comfortable talking to you out here. She grabbed her cigarettes and lighter off the little TV tray next to the rocker and went in. Come on, we'll sit in the living room if you can stand the mess. That'd be fine with me, anywhere. The old boarding house was dark and musty inside. The scent of stale cigarette smoke and hung heavy in the air. Vivian threw some old newspapers and magazines out of her recliner and gestured to it. This all right? Yes, thank you. She took a seat on a lopsided brown sofa about five feet away and lit a fresh cigarette off the butt end of the other one. Would you hand me an ashtray? There should be one over on your right, on that table there. Look under that bunch of papers. There it is. I passed the, I passed the ashtray over and envied her her cigarette. You have a nice house, I said, and I started to look around. I don't know if I'd call it nice. It needs work. You don't have long here today. I've got an appointment to get my hair done in about a half an hour. My niece is picking me up, and she should be here in about 15 minutes. I'll make this brief, I said. I opened my notebook to a clean page and pulled a pen out of my pocket. You first met Pastor Faust when he and his wife Ruby lived here. Is that right? Well, you said you already know about all that. But yeah, they lived here about, oh, I guess it was 25 years ago or more. I never had a problem with Ruby. Felt sorry for her, though. Tell me about Pastor Faust first. Oh, Charles? I can't believe he's still calling himself a pastor. I hear a lot about him these days when I go to church. Pastor Faust is a pastor. I hear you can get ordained through the mail these days, she said. Ain't that something? Well, I don't think... Tell me about the first time you met Pastor Faust. He came here back in 1969, I believe it was. Said he came here from out west somewhere, him and Ruby. Colorado, I said. Wealth Springs, Colorado. If you say so. I can't remember little trivial stuff like that anymore. He came here to my boarding house and said he just got into town and needed a place to stay for a little while, and he was starting a church. Well, I've never been one to hold it against anybody if they have different religious beliefs than I do. I did ask him if he was a Methodist, though. I go to the Methodist church here, like I said, when I have time. It's hard, though, nowadays. I have to get rides, and people aren't always dependable for rides. You'd think with me, I've been going to that church since I was a child and everybody knows me, but can they remember which Sundays they're supposed to come pick me up? No, no. Heck no. She thumped her cigarette in the ashtray just before she was about to ash all over herself. What was the question? I'd almost forgotten it myself and had to think. I wondered if you could tell me about the first time you met Pastor Faust. Are you a reporter or something? No, ma'am. I'm just a curious type person. What are you going to do with that information? She pointed at my notebook, and I wished Aiden could have been there to do away with that curiosity. I don't know how he managed to do it, but he could make people not even notice the notebook. Drew never said anything about it while I was talking to her, and so obviously writing down everything she said. A hidden tape recorder would have done me a world of good. Why hadn't I bought one by now? It's just for my own use, I said. I knew if I told her it was for Pastor Faust's biography, she would have pitched a fit and sent me scrambling on that big front lawn. I'd have to work out the details with Aiden later. You know, copyright laws or whatever applied to using people's own words in a book without their permission. She could sue us otherwise. Your own use, she said. Hadn't a young girl like you got better things to do on a Saturday afternoon than to sit here and talk to me? No, ma'am. Faust did tell you to come here, didn't he? This wasn't going well. I could tell she was getting angry and I felt backed into a corner. Should I tell her the truth now? Should I make something up? I wish I'd never told her about being a member of the Open Arms. I just volunteered that. She didn't ask me about where I went to church. It reminded me of being in Child Protective Services all over again. There's nothing like the feeling of having to go into a stranger's house, having to tell them something like, someone has accused you that you, someone has alleged that you've been abusing your child in such and such a way, and then having to listen to them vent their spleen about it. 
They'd ask me over and over again who called the report in. And I'd have all I all I had come to their house for was to go over the allegations and get their side of the story, but more often than not, the accused person was more interested in finding out who called the report in than trying to answer my questions. They usually tried to guess who it was, like it was some sort of a game where I'd have to tell them if they got it right, but by law, I really couldn't tell them. They used to aggravate the crap out of me. It can, really be, it can be really unproductive, not to mention scary, if you don't handle yourself in the situation with some tact and common sense. But sometimes things can get screwed up even when you do. I remember this one time, an old man sicked his rooster on me. A freaking gamecock! He bit a plug out of my right calf and spurred me several times before I could get back in the bus and shut the door. I had to get a police officer to go out there the second time just to do my daggone job. I took a deep breath and tried again. No, ma'am. Pastor Faust had nothing to do with me coming here, like I said. Can you just tell me what it is you have against him? I promise if you do that, I'll go away and never bother you again. There was something about him I didn't trust from the first minute I laid eyes on him, she said. I don't know what it was, but something made me wonder what he had to hide. I could tell he had a past he was running from, and I regret ever letting him stay here. I never did get a straight answer from him about why he left Colorado. All he did was say God told him to come here. Now, how many people out there can get away with saying God talked to them without everybody thinking they're nuts? But Pastor Faust has proven over and over again since he moved to Dalton Fisher that he's not your typical nutcase, I said. I mean, well, he's not a nutcase at all. Look at what he did right here in 1970, for Pete's sake. You've got to see for yourself, and you got to see it for yourself, and you still doubt him. If it weren't for him living here at the time that tornado came through, this house wouldn't even be standing right now. You know, people can get power from places other than God, she said. But he, why am I even talking to you about this? But what, I wanted to know. I even stopped writing so maybe she wouldn't be so self-conscious. It was the stuff I heard at night, coming from their room upstairs. The way he'd yell at Ruby. Some of the things he said to her. It wasn't her fault that his church didn't do too good the first month or two they were here, was it? Of course not. Heck no. But sometimes at night, I'd go up the stairs and stand in the hallway where I could hear what he was saying. He gave her hell more times than I can count those first few weeks. And she was pregnant at the time, working at the stapler factory, just dead on her feet. What a jerk. I don't care what a man can do. If he's mean to his wife or his children like that for no reason, he's a dog in my book. What kind of things did he say to her? Can you remember? Oh, it's hard to say word for word anymore. I know he called her a pathetic, ungodly woman a few times. Said she wasn't spiritual enough and that's why nobody came to his church. And she'd just cry and cry. Apologize to him over and over for stuff that wasn't even her fault. Really? Oh, yeah. I heard it all myself. And there wasn't anybody else staying upstairs at that time, so I know it was Charles doing all that yelling. His voice was pretty distinctive back then. I can't say if it still is, but that back then it was. It still is, I told her. Really loud, sort of booms all over the place. Like a big old grizzly bear, she said. Yeah. I remember one time when he was yelling at her, he told her she needed to be more appreciative of him because if it wasn't for him, she wouldn't be saved. That's just blasphemy if you ask me. I'm sure he meant that he's the one who showed her the truth. He said that to us in service before, and sometimes he has to get rough with us like that for us to... That doesn't make it right, Vivian snapped. It's too easy to confuse a statement like that. If what he really means is he showed them to God or whatever, then he ought to just say it like that. If it wasn't for me, you wouldn't be saved. That's just vulgar. She lit another cigarette off the one she'd been smoking and continued. Ruby was such a pretty girl when they first moved here. But it's like he'd drain the life right out of her after a while. By the time they moved out, you could look in her eyes and see something wasn't there anymore. I think he broke her spirit, and it didn't take long either. She seemed so happy when they first moved here, and after a month or two, she was crying herself to sleep just about every night. I remember when they first came here, lots of times we used to sit in the kitchen in the morning and talk about everything under the sun. Then she'd go off to work, and I wouldn't see her again until the next morning, because after work, she went by the church to see what Charles needed help with. But I guess Charles found out after a while she was talking to me, because one day I went up to their room to see what she was up to, and she wouldn't even come to the door. She said she couldn't talk to me anymore. Charles didn't care one whit for me, and he made sure Ruby stayed away from me. He even had her walk to the church in the mornings before she had to go to work. And it was early in the morning, too. 
But why didn't Pastor Faust like you? Beats me. Maybe he's one of those people who thinks you're evil or something if you go to a different church. I can't say for sure if that's if that was it, but that's what I think it was. He never told me to my face why he didn't like me or why he wouldn't let Ruby have anything to do with me anymore. And to tell you the truth, I never asked him. Did you ever overhear him say anything to sis, Ruby, about why he didn't like you or why she couldn't talk to you anymore? She huffed. Are you paying attention? I just said I didn't know and never tried to find out. I'm sorry. Yes, you did say that. I regrouped and tried to think of another question. Did it bother you that you couldn't talk to Ruby anymore? I'll admit, I've never had a lot of friends. I guess my temper runs people off. I just ran this boarding house and tried to keep things going for myself, you know. It was nice talking to Ruby, even if we only got to do it in the mornings for a few weeks. She was a really interesting person to talk to. She had a lot of stories to tell about her childhood, growing up in Colorado in a foster home and all that. But then after whatever Charles did or said to her, she avoided me like the plague. She sighed and waved her cigarette back and forth. I tried to talk to her a couple of times to see what I'd done to make her stop coming around, but whenever she saw me, she'd just keep going. Kept her head down and kept on walking like she didn't hear me talking to her. After a while, I figured out it was Charles that had done it to her. How'd you figure that out? I heard him tell, I heard him tell her not to talk to other people, too. She'd gotten to know some people from working at that stapler factory, and when Charles found out from Ken, from Ken Thomas that she was eating lunch with him and carrying on conversations with him, he put a stop to that in a hurry. Told her if he ever heard tell of her speaking to anybody else without his approval again, he'd make sure she was sorry for it. Now that's a threat if I ever heard one. I overheard that standing out in the hall by their room one night. Not that I was eavesdropping or anything. I didn't know. I don't know that he ever hit her or beat her or anything. But I think he would have if she'd gone against his wishes in any way. Who was she talking to that Pastor Faust didn't like? I don't remember names anymore. Just people at the factory is all I know. If it hadn't been for that Ken Thomas, I think life at the factory would have been a lot better for Ruby. So you know Brother Ken Thomas? Vivian rolled her eyes. Of course I do. I've lived in this town all my life and know everybody there is to know. And there's another reason for me to not like Charles right there. She stopped herself. What reason is that? She slid over on the couch and leaned in close to me her cigarette almost touching my knee. This is just speculation, she said, but I think your pastor fa I think your pastor had something to do with Judith disappearing all those years ago. Judith, that's Brother Ken's wife, I said, or was. Right, she was here that day Charles was up on my porch, stomping and shouting like some crazy baboon. Nobody saw her again much after that. I think it was probably a week later that she just up and disappeared. Her mother died not too long after that, so we can't ask her what happened to Judith. The question I've been asking myself ever since is, why would a woman go off and leave her husband and two small children? She was ungodly, I said before I could stop myself. Ungodly? That's a hateful thing to say. And what right do you have to judge somebody else like that? You best leave that up to the Lord. But it's... I couldn't think of a way of explaining this to this lost woman that that was what Pastor Faust had said. And if anybody would know such a thing, Pastor Faust would. No way would she buy that. I'm sorry, I said. I don't know because I wasn't there. Shoot, I wasn't even alive when all this happened. Darn right you weren't. What are you, 18? 25, actually. Well, you still weren't around then. Charles and Ken, Charles had Ken so wrapped up in that little church of his that I bet he got rid of Judith just so he wouldn't have any more outside ties to keep him away. Ken and Charles were joined at the hip after a while. They went everywhere together. Brother Ken has been a very faithful servant to Pastor Faust, I said. I figured as much. Charles has him right where he wants him. He's a slave in that church. Has been for over 25 years now. The weirdest part was the way Ken reacted when his wife supposedly left. He never seemed upset or anything. I even asked him about it one day when I saw him in the supermarket. How was he holding up, you know? He just smiled at me and said it was God's plan. He was where God wanted him, and that was it. He really wasn't bothered by the fact that Judith just up and vanished. She stared at me hard. I know you've been here long enough to hear about the protesters, she said. What do you think about what they've been saying? My heart froze. What this had to do with Brother Ken or his missing wife, I had no idea. But I was pretty sure it was a loaded question, whatever she meant by that. She was a member of the Dalton Methodist Church where most of those protesters were. 
I wondered if she'd taken part in any of their little outings. Either way, I knew I'd have to be careful with my answer. I didn't want to give her any ammo to go back and share with those people. Yes, ma'am, I said. I'm well aware that there's a group of people in town saying certain things about Pastor Faust. Have you had a chance to meet Eduardo? She asked me. Who? No, ma'am. No, I, I haven't ever met with him or talked to him. Well, we single sisters are usually too busy with our own activities to spend any time with the... Do you know who he is? She asked. I do know who he is. Yeah, Brother Eduardo Flores. He's been... He's in a foster home, Vivian said, her face turning a bright red as she spoke, and his foster parents go to my church. They're friends of mine. You haven't ever heard such a sick, horrible story till you hear what that man did to him. I guess you don't know anything about that, huh? Pastor Faust said we shouldn't. Charles Faust raped that little boy, she said. We all know it. You sit here so self-righteous. She took a moment to compose herself. You people, I'm trying to help you. You listen in that church, and you lead a very shel you people in that church, you lead a very sheltered life. Does he still tell you not to watch the news or listen to the radio or read the paper? I cleared my throat. It's <clears throat> we choose not to expose ourselves to the media because it's biased, and with all the news out there about the upcoming trial and everything, yeah, we steer clear of any news about that. But he's telling you to. That's why you do it. Don't you ever wonder if there's another reason why he doesn't want you hearing about it? I looked at my watch. Gosh, it's about time for your niece to get here, isn't it? I don't want to hold you up. She leaned forward and grabbed my hands. If you're so interested in collecting information, learning about this man you call Pastor, go talk to Eduardo Flores. He's staying with Grace and Tim Stone. Write that down. I recoiled, almost afraid of what she was suggesting. If we were supposed to avoid the news, then actually talking to Brother Eduardo would have to be like a cardinal sin, a sin unto death. Write those names down, she snapped, jabbing her stubby finger into my notebook. Grace and Tim Stone, S-T-O-N-E. Their address and phone number are in the book. Write it. I did as I was told, but I vowed at that moment that I'd never do anything with the information. I'd tear that page out of the notebook and throw it away. Vivian watched me write the names down, then nodded. She sat back a little. I've got no reason to lie, she said, and it reminded me of Drew. If you're curious to find out what, about Charles Faust, you'll go beyond all the happy propaganda his church puts out. You'll dig. I can't. Child, you couldn't tell. I could tell you stories of things that man did to Eduardo that make you puke on the floor right here where you sit. I mean, you'd be physically ill to hear it. Eduardo almost committed suicide over it. <laughs> I didn't realize I was shaking until I stood up. Thank you so much for your time, I heard myself say, and I opened the front door to find myself face to face with a woman I presume was Vivian's niece. Go see that boy, Vivian shouted from inside the house. I didn't turn around. I just nodded quickly at the niece and ran down the porch steps. Vivian kept yelling out the window, Charles Faust raped that boy. He's raped hundreds of those men. It's been going on for years, and people have been murdered because of it. Go see Eduardo Flores. I didn't stop running until I reached the bus. I jumped in and drove about two blocks away where I parked. I went to grab my notebook out of the passenger seat where I'd thrown it, only to be startled by seeing Aiden there. He smiled and clapped his hands together lightly a few times. I knew you'd go today, he said, and he handed the notebook to me. I take it you had a productive meeting, too, from the way you came running out of there. You saw that? Where were you? Sitting right here. You were too upset to notice, I guess. Why didn't you go in there with me, I asked. I didn't know what to do. He, he took the notebook back from me and read through the scattered mess I'd managed to write down while I was talking to Vivian. From the looks of this, you did just fine. He closed the notebook and looked over at me. So tell me, what made you come flaming out of there the way you did? That woman, she told me that Brother Eduardo's foster parents go to the Methodist church, the, the one most of the protesters go to, and she's a member too. I see you wrote down the foster parents' names, Grace and Tim Stone. Vivian made me. She said I need to go talk to Brother Eduardo if, real, if I really want to know about Pastor Faust. Can you believe that? She, that woman's crazy. I screwed up back there. She didn't ask, but I told her I'd go to the open arms. I think I made her more, why do you think Vivian's crazy? Well, she apparently heard, and I don't know whether this came from Brother Eduardo or the foster parents or what, she said she heard all sorts of awful things that Pastor Faust supposedly did to Brother Eduardo. She said, I need to go talk to Brother Eduardo and hear what he has to say. 
but there's no way I'm going to do that. I've already made up my mind about it. Pastor Faust said we shouldn't talk to anybody, the protesters, reporters, or anybody. So talking to Brother Eduardo about all that crap's definitely out of the question. Aiden was looking off into space while I was talking. Are you listening to me? Can you believe she actually told me to go? You're going, he said. And I can't believe... Excuse me? I said you're going. You're going to call Grace and Tim Stone as soon as we leave... Oh, no, Aiden. Forget it. I can't believe you didn't suggest that. How can you possibly think that's a good idea? Pastor Faust will kill you and me both. Aiden let out an indignant burst of laughter. There'll be no killing going on. I can promise you that. You're going. I was stupefied. I thought you were supposed to be helping Pastor Faust. How in the world could going to talk to a liar like Brother Eduardo possibly help anything? What if we go interview some of the single brothers next? Or Aiden threw the notebook back at me and shouted, You'll talk to who I tell you to talk to. Do you understand? You'll go where I tell you to go. You'll do what I tell you to do. And you'll say what I tell you to say. I was on the verge of tears all of a sudden, probably more out of confusion than fear. I blinked a few times. I just don't understand, Aiden. Can't you see that? And I'm I'm really scared, too. I don't know why. He reached over and took my hand. God, Liddy. What did I... I didn't mean to blow up at you like that. There are so many things going on right now that you don't know about that have stressed out a lot of people. But that's no excuse for the way I just spoke to you. I want to help Charles, Pastor Faust, just as much as you do. We're on the same side, and I... What I did just now was very wrong, and I apologize. He squeezed my fingers. It won't ever happen again, Liddy. I promise. I started crying. I couldn't help it. Tell me how this... how Tell me how this is going to end, Aiden. Fast forward me ahead a year so I can see how it turns out. I just want to understand. Aiden sighed. He was still holding onto my hand. I can't do that. I wish I could, but telling you that now would ensure that some of it would never happen. So many good things would never come to be if you knew the outcome. <laughs> what? How can that be? What difference would it make if I knew? You can't know. It's in the best interest of so many people out there that you don't. You have to trust me. And you also have to do what I say. No questions. Do you want to help people? Of course I do. Part of our goal in being a part of this ministry... I'm not talking about the, the ministry, Liddy. I'm talking about you. You have to pay attention and blow the dust off that brain of yours. Do you want to help people? Yes, sir. Do you want to see the truth about Pastor Faust come out for everyone to finally see once and for all? Yes, sir. Do you want to do your part to make that happen? Yes, sir. Absolutely. Then you have to trust and obey. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Okay. Is there anything else about your visit with Vivian that you'd like to write down before you forget it? Oh, yeah. I can't think. No, sir. I've written down everything I need. It wasn't true, but he didn't seem to be in the mood to sit around and wait for me to scribble anything down. I just have to see what I could remember later when I had some free time. If I ever had any free time again, I was starting to think I wouldn't. Excellent, Aiden said. Start up the bus and get, out of, get us out of this alley. We have to go find a payphone. Do I need to check in with the church? Nobody has any idea where I am right now. Don't worry about that, he said. Go find a phone and hurry. Who are we going to call? Grace and Tim Stone. You'll need to confirm your meeting with Eduardo this evening. Chapter 92 Pastor Faust was restless. He paced back and forth in his office after Aiden left, and there was nothing to do on this Saturday afternoon to occupy his mind. He thought about calling up some of the brothers to his office, but he knew that wouldn't solve the problem at hand. He picked up the phone and dialed the number to Carl's room at the hotel. Two rings. Carl answered just before the third. Pastor Faust didn't even wait for the hello. We've got to get to Eduardo, he said. I know they've been talking to him, those child welfare people, filling his head with nonsense. Can we get him over here before the hearing? Carl was silent. Are you there? Pastor Faust shouted. Are you deaf? You said I should call you if I needed your help. Call me any time, day or night, you said. He heard a sigh. You know you just cause yourself more trouble if you tried that, Carl said. Let the lawyers worry about the bothersome little details. That's what you're paying them for, right? But they wouldn't even think to worry about this, Carl. Charles, you got two of the best attorneys money can buy. Really, I wouldn't lose any sleep over it at this point. There's nothing the state can do to you. Eduardo can say whatever he wants to. 
It's proof, or lack thereof, that'll sway the judge one way or the other. It's his word against yours. Now, who do you think the judge is going to believe? Pastor Faust was sweating. Carl, come over here. I'm going to get Brother Stewart to come get you as soon as we get off the phone. I really need to talk to somebody, and you're the only one I feel like I can trust right now. But what about your right-hand man, Brother Ken? Where's he? Brother Ken? I don't know. Out at the hospital singing hymns to the sick or reading Bible verses to him or something. He's always doing stuff like that. I can't talk to him about this too much anyway. He gets really uneasy when we talk about it. He says he can't even stand the thought of me ending up in prison. And I don't... I'm hanging up now. Stuart delivered Carl at the main entrance of the church about a half hour later. Pastor Faust was waiting for him on the front steps. Come on up, he said. Let's hurry. I don't want anybody seeing us or trying to stop and talk. Pa- back up in Pastor Faust's office, Pastor Faust closed the door and locked it. I can't do the sermon tomorrow morning, he said. Tomorrow evening either. I just can't handle it right now. I'm too stressed out to have to get up there and talk to those people. They're traitors, every one of them. How else can you explain what's happened? Carl sat down in one of the chairs in front of Pastor Faust's desk. Those people, your parishioners who come here faithfully every week, they're your greatest allies right now. You need to be focusing your attention on rallying them around you, making them see that this is all a bunch of lies, a conspiracy formulated by a handful of disgruntled former members. If you're not spending your time talking to your attorneys and helping them get depositions or find witnesses and evidence, you need to be kissing up to every person you can, in the church and out of it. Find any politicians you've ever given support to. I know you've been a big financial supporter of the NAACP for a lot of years. It's time you went to them and asked them for a payback for all the money you've invested in their organization. How many fundraising dinners have you hosted for them here at the church? Dozens, I'm sure. Cash in that favor. Now's the time to do it. And along the lines of rallying the troops, so to speak, I've got another idea. What's that? It's totally hokey, homespun and all that, but I think the people will love it. I call it the Yellow Ribbon Campaign. The what? Pastor Faust said. What's that supposed to do? The Yellow Ribbon Campaign is the answer you've been looking for in terms of keeping your congregation happy. We want their support, right? We want this case to be on their minds constantly. No, we don't. I want them to forget about it. That's what I think they need to do, and I've been trying hard to get them to do that. Why do you think I stress the point so hard that they need to avoid the media? All forms of media. I don't think that's the way to go, Carl said. Those people go to work and they'll hear things from other people. They'll turn on the radio in the car and hear something. They have family members who aren't in this church and they'll talk. They need some tang- some tangible thing they can see to combat all that negative information. And what they need is something small. Something simple. A yellow ribbon. Where'd you get this crazy idea from? Carl smiled. It just came to me last night while I was saying my bedtime prayers. No, really. Denali suggested it. He feels bad about not being able to help you out with this. So he gave me this little nugget of an idea. But hear the whole thing out before you shoot it down, okay? All right, fine. Let's hear it. It's, It's Denali's. Whoever. I think it's a great idea. You see, you get the brothers to make up a bunch of yellow ribbons, put them on pins, and get the church members to wear them on their lapels or blouses or whatever to show their support. Get them to wear them everywhere they go, to work, to the grocery store, just all over the place. People in town will start to see them and ask questions. It gives people a chance to show their support for you in this case. Make up big signs with giant yellow ribbons painted on them and put them all over town with slogans like, The truth shall set you free and things like that. You can even get everybody in the church here together for a gigantic group photo with everybody wearing their yellow ribbons. Sell reprints to the congregation members for, say, $10 a piece. There's a good fundraiser right there. I don't have time for all that mess. Don't you know this trial's starting in about a week? We can get the brothers started on it today, Carl said. How'd you end up having to go to court so fast? Don't cases like this normally take longer? Aiden said he did something to speed the process up. He said it'll get it over with faster and we can all get on with our lives. He's got his hands all in this thing, apparently. I guess it's his way of trying to help since he's not skilled enough to just to make the whole thing go away. If he had any kind of real powers, it never would have happened in the first place. Pastor Faust started to hyperventilate and reached in his bag drawer for his albuterol inhaler. He took two, pu- two puffs of it and threw it back in the drawer. This is going to kill me, sure as the world. 
Let me gather all the single brothers together that I can find, Carl said, and we'll head down to that fabric store in Dalton to see how much yellow ribbon we can find. We'll work all night. I promise we won't let you down. Just as Carl was about to head out the door, Pastor Faust called, called him back. Has anybody approached you about testifying for this trial? No, not yet. Why, do you want me to? It would really help me. I need all the character witnesses I can find, and I know you could testify that none of that stuff actually happened. Whatever Brother Eduardo's going to say happened, that is. I'd be glad to do it. What kind of trial is this, anyway? It's got something to do with child welfare and the police. I don't know. The lawyers take care of all that for me. I'm supposed to just show up. I'll be there. I'll hang around Dalton Fisher as long as you need me to. Oh, on the yellow ribbons, do you mind if we use some of the church's petty cash to fund that? I don't care. Whatever you want to do. It'll be pretty expensive with the big signs and all. We've got plenty of spare money floating around this place. Use whatever you think you'll need. Just charge it to the church. Thanks, Pastor. And before you go, stop down at the front office and have whoever's down there to send Brother Jake up here, Pastor Faust, Pastor Faust said. I got a special task for him this evening since you're obviously going to be busy. Yes, sir, Carl darted away. <laughs> Pastor Faust heard him singing, Today could be the day as the elevator doors closed, and he grunted at the enthusiasm. Chapter 93 Grace and Tim Stone had a really nice house on the south side of Dalton. I found it with no problem, since Aiden apparently already knew how to get there. Grace was in the yard when we pulled up. She, looks like, she looked like she was studying her potted ferns, but I think she was really out there waiting for us. She came to the driver's side of the bus. My goodness, she said as I rolled down my window. I haven't seen a Volkswagen like this since I was your age. How old is this thing? It's a 1970, so it's 27 years old. Older than I am, actually. Well, come on inside, she said. Can she see you? I whispered to Aiden as I turned to take my seatbelt off. Of course, we're both child welfare, and we have travel in twos for cases like this. We're what? You have to assume that role once again, I'm afraid. I didn't want to tell you until we got here. I was afraid you'd change your mind. Now let's get out before she starts to suspect something. He handed me my notebook. Don't forget this. I saw Tim and Brother Eduardo sitting in the living room when we walked in. I don't believe I've seen you before, Tim said. With all the time I've spent with child welfare folks in the past few years. What's your name? He was looking at me, not Aiden. My name's Liddy Roberts, I said, and I shook his hand. I gestured to Aiden, and this is... Oh, I know this man, Tim said, and he grabbed Aiden's hand and shook it vigorously. We go way back. I raised an eyebrow and glanced over at Aiden. You do? Really? Aiden winked at me. Shoot, yeah, Grace and I have been foster parents off and on again for close to ten years. And Andy's been with child welfare now for... How long has it been? Oh, too long, Aiden chuckled. Too, too long. We walked over to Brother Eduardo, who had stood up and taken a few steps toward us. How you doing there, Eduardo? Good, Brother Eduardo said. He looked good. I always thought those bags under his eyes were just genetic or something. They were gone now. I'm doing better than I was. Nice to see you again. Yeah, you too, Andy. Grace came in with three glasses of lemonade and left them on the coffee table in front of the sofa. These are for you guys. We'll just leave you alone to talk now. Is there anything you need? Are you hungry? No, ma'am, I said. I'm fine. Is it all right if we turn on this lamp over here, Aiden asked. He moved toward a floor lamp on the left side of the television. Oh, that's fine. We'll be in this study if you need us. Andy, you know where it is. I surely do, Aiden said in a chirping voice. He could be so peppy when he wanted to be. It was scary. Thank you so much. Grace and Tim left the den, and they closed the door behind them. Aiden took a seat on the sofa where Brother Eduardo had been sitting, and I just sort of stood there in the middle of the room looking around. Brother Eduardo picked up one of the glasses of lemonade and took a seat in a brown leather recliner near the television. You can sit down if you want to, he said, on the couch or wherever. I quickly sat down beside him on the sofa. How's your day been, Aiden asked Brother Eduardo. Has anybody tried to come by to see you or talk to you since you la I saw you last? No, nobody, Brother Eduardo said. It's been real quiet. You prob you're probably curious as to why I brought this young lady with me this time, Aiden said as he slapped me on the knee. Yeah, I was wondering about that. I don't mind, but I thought I was wondering a little bit. Liddy Roberts is one of the best people in the state when it comes to child sexual abuse cases. We felt it was necessary to have her input, you know, with this turning into a criminal case and all. Criminal case, I hissed. 
I didn't mean to. It just caught me off guard. Aiden gave me a hard look. Don't let her appearance deceive you, he said to Brother Eduardo. She's got a lot of experience in cases like yours. We're like pastors do what C.T. Faust did to me, Eduardo asked. Is that a common thing or something? We see more of it in the Catholic Church than in situations like yours, Aiden said. Lately, anyway. Liddy's here to ask you a few questions. By the way, are you ready for your big television interview? <laughs> I started to say something but kept my mouth shut. Sometimes you learn more that way. I guess, Brother Eduardo said. I'm nervous about it. They say it's not supposed to air till the trial's over, but, I mean, what if it does? They won't air it before it's over with. Trust me, I'm not going to let anything bad happen to you, Eduardo. You have nothing to fear as long as you tell the truth. Oh, I'll be telling the truth. There's no... I don't have nothing to hide. No, I'm not proud of it. All the stuff that went on, but I won't lie. No. Good. Excellent. Aiden looked over at me. Eduardo's going on Primetime America to tell the world what happened to him. That's the ABC network. Have you ever seen the show? A couple times, I said. It's pretty good. They've got good reporters. I like the layout of the show. Nice and colorful. I sounded so stupid. One of the best in the state in sex abuse cases, indeed. So, when are they coming, Aiden asked him. Tomorrow night, right? I think so. Like around seven or something. Nobody knows about it, so don't say anything. Oh, we won't, Aiden said. We'll keep it top secret so nobody comes here and tries to cause you any problems. Now, Liddy, I believe you had some things you wanted to talk to Eduardo about. Uh, yeah, I sure did. Eduardo, is that okay with you? Brother Eduardo shrugged and took a big drink of his lemonade. I took a deep breath and opened my notebook to a clean page. Remember not to call him brother, Aiden whispered in my ear. Just Eduardo is fine. You don't go to the, you don't go to his church, and you've never seen him before. You're child welfare, so think like a child welfare, welfare worker. Okay, Eduardo, when did you first meet Pastor uh, Charles Faust? I met him when I was 12. I was staying with my mom in Los Angeles. He's the head of the Open Arms Christian Church, and he was visiting the church there where, where my, my mother lives. Uh, he lives here, though. But how did you meet him? Los Angeles is a pretty big place. Y'all probably weren't in each other's backyards or anything. My mom had been going to the Open Arms Church for a few months, and I met Faust one Sunday when we were there for the morning service. He actually came up to me, walked up the aisle, and laid his hand on my shoulder and told everybody I was going to have a great walk with God if I chose to stay in the church and obey him, obey Pastor Faust. I thought about the time Pastor Faust prophesied about me in the, at the conference in 1995. I remember how special that made me feel, how privileged. It was like being pulled up on stage by your favorite rock star, being chosen out of thousands of people for whatever reason. You're special, even if it's just for a moment, and even if you're just up there because you were the closest one within reach. <laughs> okay, I said, and I wrote down his response to my question. So you've known Pastor Faust for quite some time now. You're how old? Sixteen? Sixteen, yeah. Right. So, how is it that you say Charles Faust abused you? If you, weren't, if you were living out in Los Angeles and he's here on Dalton Fisher, Indiana, how's that possible? My mom's good friends with the head of the church out there, Ray Anderson. She asked him if I could stay with him for a while. I was getting in with a bad group of kids where we were living, and I guess she thought I'd have... She thought I'd do better if I was in a better neighborhood. So, Ray and his wife, Helen, said, yeah, I could stay with them. It was just supposed to be temporary, but I ended up staying there until Faust had me shipped up here permanently. I couldn't... There was no way I was about to live with him. Not after what he... Let's slow down a bit, okay? I appreciate your enthusiasm, though. Tell me in your words what happened. Like, the first time C.T. Faust ever did anything to me? First of all, I said, what are your allegations? C.T. Faust... Liddy, Aiden said, and I could tell he was irritated. But how was I supposed to know if I didn't ask? The allegations are included on the intake form I gave you on the way over here. We don't need to go over all that again. Just the same, I said. I'd like to do it anyway. <laughs> the allegations, uh, Eduardo said, basically that C.T. Faust sexually abused me for a period of about four years, ending when I called the police and got taken out of his house. Other men in the church were involved in it, too. Is that good enough? Have you had a medical examination, I asked. Yeah, they took me to St. Francis and had somebody check me out. They couldn't 
they said they didn't really find anything. But that's just because I hadn't been here long and Faust hadn't had time to really get me alone yet. Ah, okay. So tell me how Charles Faust would abuse you. He'd, it didn't start out that way. Like he just came up to me one day and said, hey, I want to have sex with you or anything like that. He started out just being nice to me, calling me from here when I was still living with Ray and Helen. And then this one time he came to visit the church in Los Angeles. Um, he asked me if I wanted to fly back here with him. I was, it was a big honor. He was like a bishop and all, which I took to mean he was like the Pope. And then we talked about masturbation and sex some every now and then while I was here. And then he convinced me that having sex with another man wasn't wrong and lo as long as there's no love or lust. And we had sex, me and him and some other men in the church. Who else was involved, Eduardo? Can you tell me the other men's names? Can you give me some details? Brother Eduardo glanced over at Aiden. I don't... Can we talk about all this without my... With, can we talk about all this without my lawyer here? I don't feel comfortable getting into details. Aiden was staring out the window that looked out on the front lawn. I'm afraid we may have to continue this later, he said, without looking away from the window. Brother Eduardo sat up and looked out. He jumped up immediately and started to run out of the room. Wait, Aiden called, and Brother Eduardo stopped. Eduardo, I want you to go out the front door like you're going to check the mailbox or something. Just take your time walking out there. But I know Brother Jake's out there, Aiden snapped. Go out there and act like you're like act like you don't see him hiding in the shrubs. Let him take you out to the van. Go with him wherever he's going and don't worry. I'll be with you. I'll protect you. You know that. Yes, sir. Brother Eduardo slowly moved toward the door and opened it. He paused and then stepped out onto the front, onto the front porch. Aiden and I watched as he made his way down the sidewalk. He didn't make it far before Brother Jake, sprang, Brother Jake sprang up out of the shrubs and took him down by the waist in a flying tackle. Any idiot would have heard him out there, Aiden said. He's obviously out of practice. But I guess with the days of CAN and deprogrammers being over since the 80s, training exercises aren't on the task list too often anymore. Aiden, as I, I said as I crouched down lower behind the television and watched Brother Jake literally throw Brother Eduardo in the back of one of the church's vans, what was all that about? Was this your way of getting Brother Eduardo back where he needed to be? Why couldn't we have just done that instead of having Brother Jake get involved? As soon as Grace and Tim had left the room, we could have... You've got a Bible study that starts in about ten minutes, he said. I suggest you get on the road, and I have somewhere I need to be. I ran back over to the sofa and grabbed my notebook. Where are you going? I said I'd go with him, didn't I? Yeah, but you'll never catch Brother Jake. He's already at least a mile away from here, and he drives like a maniac. So I hear. You keep forgetting the obvious. You need to work on that if you ever expect this biography to be anything other than a joke. Go get in the bus and go to your Bible study. Learn a lot. But why can't I... Too late. He was gone. Chapter 94 Liddy got to Gabby's house a little late. She knocked on the door, but nobody answered. It was unlocked, so she went in. The sisters were in the middle of a prayer, and Liddy tiptoed through the room and knelt down between Andrew and Veronica on the living room floor. Yes, amen, Andrew was saying in response to something Gabby had said in her prayer. Her hand flew up and almost struck Liddy in the face. At the end of the prayer, all the sisters looked over at Liddy. We're so happy you could make it, Gabby said. We figured there must have been something terribly wrong. I mean, you didn't pick up Sister Andrea and Sister Veronica. They had to get rides for themselves. Sorry about that, Liddy said. Andrew gave her an, ap an apologetic look. I had some things came up at home that I had to deal with this afternoon, and I sort of lost track of time. What kind of things, Gabby wanted to know. All the sisters watched Liddy intently. You know, one of the most important things to remember when you're a part of this ministry is doing what's best for your church family. You don't have to tell me what you were doing if you really don't want to. But was it in the spirit of fellowship and Christianity? Yes, ma'am, Liddy answered with a laugh. I do believe it was. She looked at Andra and Veronica. I'm sorry I didn't get to pick y'all up. I didn't mean to leave you in the, in the lurch like that. It's okay, they both answered. No biggie. Were you out getting drinks and snacks for us, Gabby asked. Sister Andra said you'd volunteered to do that. Oh, I forgot all about that. I'm sorry. Gabby cleared her throat. Well, good thing somebody else didn't forget. Let's get on with things. We don't have much time. 
Sister Lydia, with you coming in late, you'll have to get notes from somebody on all the things you missed. Veronica leaned over and whispered to Liddy, You can use mine. You'll get some good information on a good place to get your nails done. I know how important that is to you. Liddy smiled. After the Bible study was over, the sisters sat around and talked like they always did. It didn't take long for the conversation to drift toward the subject of Pastor Faust. And for the first time since she arrived at Gabby's house that evening, Liddy stopped thinking about Aiden and Eduardo and paid attention to what was going on. Let me make sure I'm clear on this, one of the sisters said. We're supposed to... What? Are we supposed to not talk about any outsider? Are we not supposed to talk to any outsiders about the trial? Or are we supposed to show our support at every available opportunity? What does that mean, anyway? Gabby rolled her eyes. Didn't you take notes in church on Wednesday? Pastor Faust said he wants us to show our support in every way possible. We just can't talk to anybody. Amen, Andrew said. And we all know this will pass, right? The sisters nodded. I mean, Brother Eduardo will eventually get his stories mixed up. He'll prove himself to be a liar. And from what I hear, he's saying other men in the ministry were involved in it too. He's lying. We all know that. Liars never win in the long run. Only the truth shall make you free, and it'll free Pastor Faust when it's all over with. We just have to continue to strive to come up higher in God and be the supportive ladies of the ministry that Pastor Faust needs us to be. Amen, the sisters answered. Amen, Sister Andra. That's exactly right. Gabby got up off the couch and headed into the kitchen to get another brownie. Liddy watched her walk away, and something about that moment made her think about the look on Eduardo's face when he was telling her about what Pastor Faust had allegedly done to him. What if Brother, Brother Eduardo's telling the truth, she asked before she stopped to think it through. What are we supposed to do then? An unnatural hush fell across the room. Gabby froze in mid-stride on her way back to the couch. Andra dropped a chip covered in ranch dip back in the bowl. Gabby composed herself enough to speak. Oh, Sister Lydia. Pastor Faust is the man who... He made this ministry, and I mean literally. He's the one who brought every single person in this room to the truth. Is there anybody here, I just want to make sure, is there anybody else here who feels the way Sister Lydia does? No, ma'am, they all answered. No way. All right. Sister Lydia, here's what you need to do. I want you to write this down so you won't forget it. You've been taking notes all evening, and this could possibly be the most important thing you can take away from here tonight. The book of James, chapter 3, verses 11 and 12. Doth the fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive, olive berries, either a vine, figs? So can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh. You remember that the next time Satan tries to deceive you, okay? Liddy hung her head. Yes, ma'am. Did you write it down? I got it. Yes, ma'am. James chapter 3, verses 11 and 12. Those two little verses are enough for me when Satan tries his business on me about about things I don't need to have polluting up my mind. Just like the thing you said a minute ago, we've got to stamp out those thoughts as soon as they happen. All you have to do is think about those two Bible verses and then you remember all the wonderful things Pastor Faust has done for you and for our ministry. Okay? Yes, ma'am. Liddy got home late that night. She had to drive Andrew and Veronica home and she heard all about Drew on the way there. It was around midnight when she got home. She didn't bother with dragging any sheets or blankets out of the closet. She curled up on her couch and cried herself to sleep. And I'm going to stop there. And we will pick up again on chapter 95 will be the next chapter. And we will start from there. Thank you so much for watching or listening, and I will see you again next time.